Dean of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament, could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices. <clears throat> Our second item of business this morning is to decide where to take items 13 and 14 in private. We had a, an agenda item earlier on um, before uh, we formally started. Are members agreed? Yes. Uh, members have signalled their agreement. Our next item of business is to take evidence on the land and buildings transaction tax, subsale development relief and multiple dwellings relief, Scotland order, 2015 draft, from Isabel D'Inverno of the Law Society of Scotland and David Stewart of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and members of copies of all written evidence received. So you'll go straight to questions from the committee. And of course, you've both been, uh, been at committee before, so you'll know that uh, I usually start off with some questions and then we open out the session to uh, colleagues around the table. So first one, I think, will be uh, to yourself, Isabel, uh, and it's <clears throat> in relation uh, to the issue of significant developments. Now, we received a, a written paper from you in which you talk about significant developments and uh, how you support the revised definition uh, of that. But you, you talk about uh, what happens if a significant development does not take place within five years. Um, the relief would be withdrawn or partially withdrawn and become repayable. Um, and what you've suggested is that it should be possible for an extension of the five-year period to be made available. Um, I'm just wondering for, for how long is this something which is going to go on for years and years and years? Because I mean, clearly, if there's going to be a sacrifice of tax income at the start uh, of the period, mm -hmm. which the Chartered Institute of Taxation suggests uh, would be a good, th it would be good if we did charge um, straight off. Then we could be talking about, you know, who knows how many years. What, what, what can you give us a wee bit more um, meat on the bones of your suggestion there? Well, I think it would be unfortunate if, um, because of <coughs> delays in planning or whatever, the development wasn't able to start until, say, year six, and yet the um, subsale development relief was, was, was all lost. I think it would need to be just a reasonable period, and um, it might need to be something that um, was at the discretion of, of Revenue Scotland, maybe, to decide what was a reasonable period, having regard to the circumstances and to what had actually been going on, um, rather than having a particular period set in stone. But that's perhaps something that needs to be discussed further with others involved in the industry to, to get some idea about it. But I do take your point that you couldn't have it going on for 15, 20 years, although some developments do go on for that long, waiting for planning and other things. What if someone decides to put in for planning four and a half years into the five-year period? I mean, that's hardly the fault of the local authority. Or, uh, you know, for example, because you know, they've got to go through their processes. I mean... Mm. Um, that, that would be unlikely for someone to delay deliberately, I would suggest. Um, and there could be some saving in the, in the provision which, which would say that you know, there was a delay caused by the, <coughs> the, the end purchaser deliberately or something like that, then they, there wouldn't be an extension. But also, if it was at Revenue Scotland's discretion, then they could take that into account. Now, obviously, you're suggesting, you know, that, uh, you know, if there's a, a, a delay of up to five years in this relief, I mean, that might have an impact on the, the revenue that's actually coming into the Scottish Government. Have you any idea as to how much that um, might be, um, if, if this was to be late? Several millions, one would, one would assume. It, it is very difficult to say. Um, many of these transactions um, are structured along the lines that the development will, will start just as soon as possible. That's in everybody's best interest. The developer um, who's involved in the development obviously is, is keen to get on with it and the end purchaser doesn't want to have it um, hanging around for ages either. So I don't think anybody's out to delay things here. Um, quite what the how many projects fall into what sort of timescales, I really can't say. But I'm sure there are others, um, Scottish Property Federation, for example, who might be able to uh, give some um, suggestions about how, how the, the figures might fall out. Okay, and you, I mean, the, the Chartered Institute of Taxation, again, have said amended relief mechanism poses a higher risk to public revenue. To accept an actual fact that the amount actually overall that will come into the Scottish Government is certainly not going to increase, but there is a possibility it might decline for all sorts of reasons. Companies going bust, whatever it happens to be, if the money's not actually um, received at the, at the beginning of the five year period. <clears throat> it's not my experience um, of advising on these projects that a huge number of uh, either developers or end purchasers go bust. 
um, the, in, the, in most of the transactions we're involved in, certainly, the, that, that doesn't happen. So I don't think it presents a, a huge risk of the, of the tax being, um, uh, the relief being allowed up front and then the development not happening. There are also other mechanisms that Revenue Scotland has. I mean, if, if people were to try and abuse this relief, then there is the GAR. Um, so, you know, if people are, are setting up fictitious arrangements in order to claim the relief, that would be uh, one way of, of, of attacking it. And um, so, so I don't think it does present a huge risk of loss of revenue. Okay, now you've also said that where development has started but not been completed, the tax chargeable is an appropriate proportion of the tax which should mean payable without relief. But if any of us around the table buy a house that costs £145,000, we'd have to stump up an LBTT straight away. Why, therefore, should there be a, a kind of um, a, only a proportion getting paid? Why shouldn't, once the work has actually started and the, the developers get the money in place to complete the project, why shouldn't the tax just be paid? Um, I think it, it goes down to this, uh, what would be fair and reasonable in all the circumstances. I think the original wording of this um, regulation said that if, it had, if, if you hadn't completely finished the development by year five, then um, there, there would be no relief. And that doesn't seem proportionate, really. If the development was all but complete, then you would think that you ought to be able to get a proportion of the relief. You know, so I, th I think it's it's a question of proportionality. Um, I mean, it's obviously different from the situation of um, buying a, a, a completed house and having to pay LBTT. Having said that, it, it's not impossible for the construction of houses to be um, uh, done in a different way, where you don't end up paying the LBTT on the on the whole of the construction costs. You know, that's not uncommon either. Um, but I, but I think the idea of this relief is is to give developers who are setting up projects um, mm. the same kind of cash flow advantage as they would get in the rest of the UK, so as to ensure that Scotland isn't at a competitive disadvantage with the rest of the UK in forward funding and other projects. Mm. I just wonder how, how big an issue that really is. But in terms of uh, just this issue of uh, clawback, um, again, I'll go back to charges of taxation. Uh, they've said that provision could be made to initiate a clawback uh, or provide security cover cover that. I mean, when when the developers actually uh, build a, a, a plan to build a site, they often uh, provide a bond to a local authority to pay for street lighting and roads, etc., etc. So if the company goes bust or whatever, that's covered. What about a clawback, uh, a kind of um, in, in indemnity to provide security? Is that something you think should be should be considered? Um, no, I don't think that that will be necessary. Um, I think that, that the, the situations where development doesn't happen um, because the end purchaser has gone bust are not, are not very frequent. Um, and the, the, the commercial arrangements are, are often such that you know, everything is teed up for the development to go ahead. So I, I, don't, I, th I think it's, it's probably worth noting that the Chartered Institute of Taxation was the only one of those responding to this consultation who thought that um, the or original version of the relief was, was appropriate. You know, everybody else looking at it took the view that developers, if, if they had to pay the tax up front and could only reclaim it uh, once the development was complete, if that was the case, developers would just say, well, this is too uncertain, we'll have to assume that we're not going to get this money back. Therefore, we'll uh, ignore it in pricing deals. So it, it would have been a fairly useless relief. I think the general consensus now is that the developer can claim it up front. They can be reasonably certain that it will be available. And so they'll be able to price it into deals. But surely the public purse has to be protected. I mean, I live in a, a site, and actually, in fact, the local authority didn't ask for a bond. The, the, the developer did go bust, and the council had to find £300,000 to put in roads and street lighting, etc. Surely, if we're going to protect the public purse, then there should be some kind of um, uh, you know, bond or whatever in place. Otherwise, it's ultimately it's the taxpayer that's going to have to lose out. Um, I think that arranging that <coughs> sort of bond or whatever would introduce unnecessary complications into
deals. Um, there is, of course, always the possibility of keeping this provision under review, and if it turns out that the public purse has been um, threatened by projects um, going belly up, then the, it, it will be open to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, to remove the relief or amend it in some way in the future. Um, you know, it's not it's not set in stone forever, so it, it may be um, appropriate for the Finance Committee to keep it under review and to ask for detailed information about the you know how many times the relief has been granted and what's going on in these projects and and so on. Hey, thank you very much, Isabel. Now, um, David, obviously you've got a big focus on mid ten year homes. Uh, uh, we talk about ensuring no taxes paying properties cost 135,000 or less. I think it's 145,000. But what what do you mean in uh, cost terms by mid uh, ten year homes? Because I've been looking at your report and I can't really see any detail of what you really mean by mid to ten year ten year homes so in financial sorry, terms. Yeah, sorry, I could certainly um, provide details from members of, of the rents that that they charge. Um, I, I don't have any with me at the moment, but, but what mid-tenure homes really are um, is where a housing association or a council provide homes that, and the rent is set very much in the middle band between what a socially rented home would be charged at and what the private rented market eh, would charge for a home. So it's very much aimed at people who are working but on relatively low incomes um, would struggle really to access a home of their own either through the private rented market or through a mortgage but are also unlikely to be uh, housed in social housing because of the, the high levels of waiting lists. So it, it's really something that's um, looking to meet a gap in the market and, and we would argue that that's really since the financial crash and since it's become more difficult for first time buyers to obtain mortgages I think it's potentially an increasingly important area to help meet housing needs and to allow young people to leave their parents' homes or, or move to a different area in order to take up employment. But are you talking about homes that, are, that, are, that cost over £145,000 a unit each? Um, in, in some cases, homes might cost that to build, but probably I'm talking mainly about... Um, development, so for example, buying land, say, to build 30 or 40 homes for mid-rent, or as had happened certainly um, on a number of occasions in Edinburgh with the uh, last uh, financial crisis, where a housing association subsidiary will buy homes from a builder who uh, decides that they can't sell them on the market. And what I'm really talking about in this submission is Associations can then get caught up um, paying, you know, reasonable sums of tax. And I think given that what they're doing is providing a service that the market doesn't provide, and actually they tend to need either grant from the Scottish Government or land at nil value from the local authority to make the scheme stack up, we're arguing that it doesn't really make sense for the government then to to draw a tax on that. So say if, say for a site was going to have 50 houses, you know, it was going to cost in Edinburgh £8 million or something like that, you're basically saying that it shouldn't be subject to LBTT at all. Or eight, I mean, even after five years, it should be, it should, uh, yeah, it should be excluded I mean, yeah, because that, of the, the uh, type of people you're hoping to provide housing, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, housing for. Really, that, that, that's the argument we're making. And... Um, while it, it's not a, a tiny part of the market, it's really quite a small part of the market. So really the case I would make as to why it should be excluded from the taxes, firstly, I don't think it would have a significant impact on the overall tax take. And obviously the Scottish Government's keen to make sure that in designing the LBTT, they still draw in the same amount of tax as would have been drawn in under the stamp duty. And secondly, as I mentioned earlier, it's the fact that we're talking about housing people whose needs not met by the market. It's effectively something that, that needs to be subsidised, albeit to a lesser extent than social rent. 
could be though that some of these houses, if an example I gave, for example, fifty houses and eight million pounds set, that'd be an average one hundred sixty thousand a unit. You could argue that that would be above the the threshold that many people would pay. You know, I mean, uh, um, I mean, um, so so for example, there'd be a, a lot of people would be buying houses for a lot less than that. You know. I mean, my, my mum's house is on sale for £58,000. It's beautiful. Yes, yes, if you like it, you know? yeah. There's a lot of low-cost private houses. My assistant bought a house for 43000 and it's an absolutely yeah, lovely yeah. flat. There's a lot of low-cost houses, but you're talking about quite significant scale of development. Is this Where would this apply, do you think? Is this something that would, would um, impact across Scotland, or is it only in specific areas such as Edinburgh, Aberdeen, where you think this is really an issue? I think it would impact across Scotland now. Previously, the view was always that um, mid-market rent only really worked in pressured areas where housing for sale was expensive and there was a lack of socially rented housing. And certainly, traditionally, most mid-market rent is in Edinburgh with some pockets in places like Aberdeen and parts of Glasgow. But actually, um, I, I spoke to a couple of housing associations recently, Loretto, and uh, they uh, have actually provided a, a, a development of units for mid-market rent in Springburn. And Shettleston Housing Association have also provided a development of units for mid-market rent. And what both associations were saying is that it's become so difficult for many people to access housing for sale that actually now there's a market for mid-market rent in areas like that. And the people that were mainly being housed were, I suppose, people who were staying at home with their families but were adults and were looking to form a house. And I think in that case, it's probably not so much about the tax on the overall cost of the property it's the fact that the association would have to be paying a tax on the cumulative cost of land for, say, 20 or 30 units, cumulative cost of, of development. And, and I would argue that, actually, I don't think that's probably what the tax aims to do, because really you're talking about people who might uh, 10 years ago have, have bought a, a, a property that was relatively low value in terms of the Scottish market the nice struggle to, to access a mortgage. Just one last question. Have you any idea how much that it, this costs housing associations a year, this tax would cost if there is no change to the current um, position? It, it would, would not be, I don't think. Um, I, I mean, I don't have a global figure. It's something I would need to research, but I, I don't think it would be an enormous amount, um, but could be on you know, individual development significant. Um, and I think given that I understand uh, and the Scottish government's refresh of its housing policy, it sees mid-market rent as being a potentially significant element and, and it's building that into its joint delivery plan. I, I just think anything that can be done to make it easier for association subsidiaries to provide mid-market rent to help meet that, that need in the housing market and, and help deliver the Scottish Government's aims, I, I, I think would be helpful. So you're, so, uh, so you're saying there's no real contradiction, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a significant amount for the Scottish Government, is what, what you're arguing, but it could be for individual associations? Yes, yeah, so, and, and it could potentially uh, make schemes more difficult to uh, stack up, but also, um, in a way, the probability, as, as I said earlier, really for the schemes to work, they need either land at below market value or nil value transferred to the subsidiary, or they need grants. So in a way, um, having a tax would really just be moving public money about, I would argue. Yeah, yeah I understand. What you're saying is it would effectively mean a larger grant if you're having to pay yes. this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'm going to open out the session to colleagues around the table. We'll be joined to be followed by Richard. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, again, if I can start with you, Mr. Inverno, just a, w one thing you actually said in answering questions uh, to the Convener was you used this term competitive disadvantage, um, which I assume means building in Scotland compared to down south. I just wonder how much of an issue that is, because you know if somebody wants to live in a place, a thousand or two here or there, 
wouldn't seem to make a difference to some to me. I mean, people still seem to want to be in London despite the fact there's a, a huge competitive disadvantage. So does that kind of amount of money really make a difference? Um, in, in relation to the sorts of transactions we're talking about, developers or many developers operate throughout the UK. So um, some of these projects, uh, they may have a choice between doing a project in Newcastle and doing one in Edinburgh or Glasgow. And if there is an extra um, tax cost for the developer in putting the project together, um, given the time that, that these projects take and given the, um, the, the margins are not uh, incredibly high, the developer might, might decide, if we don't have this relief, might decide he'll do the project in Newcastle which would, would mean it, it, it wouldn't happen in Scotland. So that, I think for that reason, uh, that's one of, one of the reasons that, that um, most people were very keen to have this development subsale relief um, available in Scotland. I mean, clearly developers want no tax and want everything to be as cheap as possible, but I mean, by that logic, no one is developing in London, but I thought there were developments going ahead in London. Um, in in uh, the UK, well, throughout the UK at the moment, in these sorts of transactions, there is subsale relief because SDLT has subsale relief across the board for all types of subsales. Obviously, in in uh, LBTT, we don't have that, so we're looking at a targeted relief for development transactions involving development. So I think, you know, once you get past the first of April, a developer, if we if this relief isn't introduced, a developer will be looking at doing a project in Scotland, it, it's going to cost more to do the project, the margin will be lower compared to doing it in Newcastle. And the, they, they may, that, that could well lead to um, them deciding to do it in Newcastle. But, but in the point. scheme of things, is that, is that not quite a small factor in the whole thing? Because the, presumably the, the first one is demand, that they want to build where there's demand. Uh, yeah. and, that, and presumably that's why people keep building in London despite the costs being absolutely huge because the demand's there. So, I mean, would it be the case that actually demand is the most important thing and the tax is really pretty minimal? Uh, not necessarily, not in, not in the way the costings for these sorts of projects work. Um, the, the imposition of a, of a tax charge in Scotland, which doesn't exist in England, could mean that a project in Scotland wouldn't be viable, whereas a project in England would be. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a, it's a simple sort of, you add in a tax charge, which isn't there in the other location, and the developer looks at the numbers and says, well, I'll go for the one in Newcastle, mm -hmm. rather than the one in Scotland, which would be a shame. That's why um, we are extremely encouraged by the fact that the Scottish Government proposes to introduce the subsale development relief. Um, to address that, that possibility. I mean, I still feel you haven't answered my question as to the <laughs> relative importance of the tax, but I, I, I'm not, I can't force you right. to do that if you don't want to. Um, the other subject uh, was this term significant development. Now, as a layperson, that seemed a bit vague to me, but you mm. actually seem quite comfortable with that in your response. I think the problem with the previous iteration of this was um, that it was, it was too rigid. You know, it said that you had to have planning permission, whereas... Many development activities don't need planning permission. Um, so that, that was too rigid. Um, it, it needs to be one of these tests that it's, it can be slightly unsatisfactory because it is a bit subjective, but it's a bit like the elephant test. You know, you can recognise it when you see it. It's quite hard to describe it, but most of the time it's going to be possible to, to, to see easily whether there is significant development. You don't think we'll end up with kind of a lot of wrangles between developers saying it's significant and Revenue Scotland saying it's not, or? Um, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought so. Um, I hope that there will be a degree of of, of sort of uh, detailed guidance. Um, time will tell, but uh, once we have some experience of what Revenue Scotland, what what view they will take of these things. Um, but in many projects, it'll be completely obvious that there's going to be significant development. There'll be an enormous development agreement that's been negotiated. There'll be a plan to build a, um, you know, an office building or a hotel or whatever it is. So it will be obvious in many cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Stewart, um, 
I mean, again, just following on from what the convener was saying, the, the whole concept of mid-market rent, I think uh, previously at the committee somebody suggested to us that often mid-market rent is about 80% of private rent. I don't know if that's a figure you would be comfortable with. I mean, it strikes me, although it's called mid-market rent, it's, it's really just a, a slightly cheaper version of private rent as compared to social rented, which is heavily subsidised. Is, do, you, do you see it that way? Um, I, I'm not sure that I would entirely agree. I mean, I, I think the differences can be significant in terms of the rent. I, I mean, 80%, I think, would be the maximum that might be charged as a proportion of private rent. But, but I think it really um, can make a big difference. Uh, to go back to the examples I was talking about in Glasgow, you're talking about providing quality housing that people have security around, uh, it's well managed uh, and they wouldn't be able to otherwise access it. So uh, I would feel it'd be unfair to characterise it as being virtually the, the same as private rent. I, I think it meets a distinctly different market. Uh, and as I said in, in uh, my answers to the convener, it's something that can't be achieved without either land at nil value or, or subsidy being provided. Now, I mean, presumably for you, in one sense, it doesn't really matter whether you get away with paying a little less tax over here or you get a bit of a grant or a subsidy from over here. I mean, there's a lot of the net figures you're looking at, I take it. I suppose that that's true, but, but I would also argue that, um, you know, there'll always be pressures on the level of grants that are available to subsidise new build council housing you build affordable rent by associations and mid-market rent. So really, anything that can be done to keep the costs down and make the grants go further, I, I would argue, you know, would be the, the best approach. But, but I take your point that if a scheme goes ahead and, and gets the grant in a way you could... I mean, I think the fear for this committee, which we've we faced with the... It kind of give it, do we have relief for eco-friendly houses or whatever yes, they were called yes, in the uh -huh. past was, as soon as we bring in a relief, somebody out there is going to start trying to use it as a loophole. Mm -hmm. They'll pretend they're a housing association or something. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas a, a grant or a subsidy, you know, we can target it. We say it's only, you know, SFHA members or whatever yes. that get it. And so it's, I would see that as more effective. But from your point of view, maybe it doesn't matter too much. I, I, I take your point, and I, I can't really comment. I'm, I'm not an ex expert on uh, taxation or, or the dangers of, of loopholes being created. I, I mean, I would hope that um, it would be possible to, to frame a relief in such a way that specified clearly what rent could be charged in order uh, to be eligible for the relief and also who could provide the housing, so I, I would have thought that was something that could be avoided, but, but I take your point that that's absolutely something that the committee and the government have to be wary of in introducing any reliefs that could potentially be used as loopholes. Okay, thank you. In your paper, it was paragraph five, it talks about back-to-back -back land sales, which I think is where we are with the sub-sale relief. I mean, you said your, it was our understanding which is mine too, that uh, the new schedule means that a developer purchasing the land it will get relief, um, but the purchasing association or subsidiary would still have to pay LBTT. So, I mean, I think the what's happening there is instead of two people paying yes, yes. tax, there's only going to be one. Yes. But you're actually arguing that nobody should pay it. I, I suppose really what I'm arguing, what I would say is I agree that the change is an improvement in what the situation would have been previously, but I think consistent with my other arguments, what I'm arguing is that mid-market rent is a, a provision that needs subsidy that wouldn't be provided for the market. So I'm arguing it should have a relief from tax. But I, I fully take your point that it's an improvement on the previous position from our members' point of view. Thanks. And my final point, I mean, you gave us this example on, on the last page, your annex, eh, about multiple dwellings relief. And if, if I'm reading these figures correctly, I mean, we're talking about a purchase of four million and the extra tax is 2,562, which by my calculation is 0.063%. I 
Um, I mean, that's not significant, is it? No, I, I mean, the uh, similar to the previous question, uh, the situation now is a big <laughs> improvement from the point of view of mid-market rent from when I came to uh, speak to the committee prior to Christmas. Just to go back to my previous answer, I suppose what I'm arguing um, and making the case is that given it's a form of development and a, a form of housing that needs subsidy, I would argue that it should be exempt from tax. But yes, I, I take your point, it's not a significant increase. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard, followed by Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Vina. My, my question is to, uh, to Mr to Stewart. Um, uh, regarding relief for multiple property acquisitions. Now, the convener earlier on mentioned um, values of property around £160,000. Now, in Aberdeen, um, uh, in my region of the North East, that would be significantly below mid-market. So for us, it's a, uh, it's a very significant issue. And just to clarify then, I mean, to whatever extent, the fact of the matter is that beyond any argument over a, an exemption, the current proposals are detrimental financially compared to stamp duty in terms of developing these properties? They are, yes. Um, it's now in a way where it, it's not as significantly detrimental as the proposals were prior to the introduction of the, the SSI that we're, we're discussing, but, but they still would be marginally detrimental. And for areas like Aberdeen or Edinburgh, I think anything that can be done to reduce costs to allow mid-market provision, I, I would argue, would be would be a good thing. Certainly, because certainly in a place like Aberdeen, even if you're saving 20-30%, that's 30% of a very high level yeah. of rent can make a huge um, difference. And just to pursue um, a little bit the, the, the proposal for uh, an exemption, I mean, presumably, is it fair to say that you don't feel that would be a significant financial burden on the Scottish Government, but could be of, of real benefit in terms of pursuing more of these um, uh, mid-market schemes? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, in terms of the scale of, of uh, mid-market rent, um, the most significant provider of it in Scotland, as far as I'm aware, is the Needham Canmore Housing Association, who have provided several hundred over a period of about 10 years. So in, in terms, in comparison to the numbers of homes developed for sale annually or even developed for social rent by associations and councils, we're not talking about a huge number, but to go back to the second part of your question, it could make a difference in terms of making a scheme affordable and workable you know, in an area like Aberdeen or, or indeed Edinburgh. And in terms of, Mr Mason mentioned potential misuse of any, um, any exemption, and presumably given regulation of housing associations, it's quite hard to pretend to be a housing association, I would have thought. Yes, I, I would think there'd be something uh, that could be written in that could say that you had to be a subsidiary of a charitable association. And as a sector, it's quite strictly regulated uh, by the Scottish Housing Regulator and by Oscar, the charity regulator. So I would hope that it would be possible to draft legislation that would you know, really make it impossible for, for that to happen. You also mentioned um, issues regarding development of homes, of housing association homes by their non-charitable subsidiaries. I mean, how, how does that work in practice? How many housing associations have such sub subsidiaries? Quite a few do, um, I, and it's something that's increasing. It really, when I'm talking about development of homes by non-charitable subsidiaries, the, the reason that happens is that because housing associations are largely charities and have strict rules and are strictly regulated, it's generally not possible for them to provide, for example, homes for sale for shared ownership or homes for mid-market rent, because that wouldn't be meeting their charitable objectives of housing those in greatest housing need. So really, as far as mid-market rent goes for associations, it has to be a non-charitable subsidiary that provides and manages mid-market rent, and this is where they then get caught up in, uh, in the tax. And just finally then, so in terms of dialogue and negotiation, Scottish Government on this issue, why, why haven't they been more receptive, do you feel, to the proposal for an exemption, or at least ensuring that this proposal wasn't detrimental financially to these proposals going forward? 
I, I suppose my feeling, I, and I, you know, I, I can't be certain on this, but I think perhaps um, associations, subsidiaries, um, initially being quite negatively impacted by the initial proposals, I would have thought was maybe an unintended consequence of the fact that the tax aimed to move really the, the burden of taxation from higher value properties to lower value properties. And I think what then happened uh, is that because associations, subsidiaries might be developing groupings of properties or buying you know, significant pieces of land, there was a detrimental impact. Uh, I feel then that the Scottish Government have responded by uh, introducing the subsale relief, which means that the detriment's not so great. But, but as I've been arguing, I, I feel that as it's um, a service that meets a need not met by the market, it, it should be exempt. Well, you said there, the Scottish Government were trying to shift the burden from higher uh, Price properties to lower, do you know what I mean? The other way around. Sorry, yes, right. yeah, that's the yeah. slip of the tongue. I, right. I meant quite the opposite. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, cheers. Malcolm to follow by Mark. Well, if I could just con continue on, on the same theme, obviously from Edinburgh, so similar kinds of housing problems as in Aberdeen, perhaps certainly a lot of people can't, well, there aren't any social rented for them and they can't afford the private rent or to buy. So mid market rent is very important in Edinburgh, so I was initially, I think still attracted to your proposal, but obviously we will have to interrogate it a bit, um, which many people have done, so there might not be much to us, to be honest. But, uh, I mean, you, you do it in terms of, I mean, the comparison with stamp duty lamp tax didn't come to a large differential, but presumably if you had a total exemption, then there would be a much bigger yes. benefit from yes. it. So that's yeah. what you would... Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. And and if and if if you don't get that, would the effect be on the supply of mid market, or could it be that the rents in mid market are going to be slightly higher than they would otherwise be, or what do you think the effect would would be? Or in other words, put it the other yes. way: if you do get the exemption, what will the effect be? Will it will it affect supply or rents or both? I think it would probably affect supply. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think mid market can only really work where. It's within a parameter, and you can't really raise the rents above that. Otherwise, you're not really meeting a distinct mm -hmm. need. It almost becomes a slightly cheaper private rent. I, I think where there would be a benefit would either be it enables certain schemes to go ahead that might not have otherwise mm -hmm. so increased the supply, or it means that overall, and I don't think this would be a huge impact, but it just means that the amount of grant available to fund mid-market or socially rented housing would, would just go slightly further than it would have otherwise? Well, I mean, I, I think we'll, we'll certainly raise these uh, points with the Cabinet Secretary in, in a little while because um, stated policy obviously is, particularly in areas like Edinburgh and Aberdeen, to increase uh, mid-market rent. And so I think we'll put it to him that's an unintended consequence, but he may have obviously some response that we're not anticipating, but I don't, I don't personally think that uh, there would be a great deal of scope for, for loopholes on this, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll wait to see what he says, but thanks for drawing it to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Just, to, just to let the witnesses know, the reason Gavin's left is been taken unwell, just in case you wondered why he wasn't here any longer. Mark, to be followed by um, Jean. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, uh, as, as, as Malcolm said, we've given this quite a good go, but one of the questions that, that, that I would just like to clear up is in terms of the exemptions or the the uh, the proposals that you're putting to us today um have you done any calculation as to how much revenue would would not be realized as a consequence of of, of taking that decision obviously lbtt was introduced with the the view of it being a revenue neutral yes, scheme yeah. and any exemptions or otherwise that might impact mm -hmm. on income as a result of that would obviously affect mm -hmm. that revenue neutrality have you any uh, calculations or, or done any uh, educated guesswork around how much you, you would be speaking about in terms of the exemption? I, I have to say I, I haven't um, as yet. Um, as I said in answer to previous questions, uh, mid-market rent certainly at the moment is a relatively niche provision. Uh, uh, it's not to say it's important, but it's not a high proportion of the overall uh, development of, of new build housing in Scotland is certainly something that um, if time allowed I'd be happy to look into both with 
member housing associations, but also with uh, the Scottish Government, because I'm sure they'll be able to provide um, through statistical returns. They'll know how many um, mid-market rent schemes or, or properties were, were developed over the last financial year. And I don't think it'd be difficult beyond that to then work out um, broadly what tax would have been paid and, and would be lost. So um, I, I can't say beyond the fact that I don't think it would be a significant proportion of the tax, but I'm happy I, I, if time allows to, to interrogate that further. And in terms of um, your the input from your members, um, uh, Obviously, Richard has spoken about Aberdeen, which I represent, and yes. Malcolm has spoken about Edinburgh. Have you had any direct representation from your members about specific developments that they have in the pipeline that they are saying, if this goes ahead, we will either put this on hold or um, we we might not be able to develop this or this would have an impact on this particular development? Not as such. The representation I've had has been... Uh, mainly from Dunedin Canmore and it's around they see mid market rent as an important uh, part of their business, a part of their service to the community and what they've really done is looked at previous developments carried out under stamp duty land tax and looked at what the difference would be uh, under the new tax. And can I maybe pose the same question to, to Isabel because you spoke about um, development choices uh, you use Newcastle Edinburgh as an example. Um, I'm not sure not sure that that's always the the calculation that is made by by a developer because most developers are looking at individual areas and the need and demand in those areas. But just to to, to throw the question to you, have you had any representation from um, developers or um, members of Law Society Scotland saying that this is a a real situation as opposed to a hypothetical one? In relation to the de development subsale relief, yes, yeah. lots, lots and lots of developers have raised concerns about the the fact that there's no general subsale relief in uh, uh, LBTC. I, I, I appreciate that they've raised the concern, yeah. but you raised the, the, the prospect of a developer choosing to develop south of the border as opposed to north of the border. Yeah. And what I'm asking is, is that a real concern that has been expressed by developers that they would choose yes. to make that decision yeah. Or is it just a hypothetical scenario that you've raised on the basis of No, it, it is. I mean, obviously, the Newcastle's a hypothetical, but well, um, it, it, it is a real concern that has been raised by, by developers saying, you know, how does it work in Scotland? How does it work in the rest of the UK? And, um, and uh, expressing the, the, the possibility that they would choose to um, do projects in, outside Scotland because of the, the additional costs. So I don't, it's, it's not a hypothetical, and I, I, I think um, that the SPF members have raised on numerous occasions, you know, lo lots of different organisations have, have raised the same concern. So I don't think it's in any, in any degree um, a completely hypothetical thing. Okay. I, can, I don't know if I could just add <coughs> that um, in relation to this relief that's being discussed for mid-market um, rent uh, it's not something that the law society had considered in any great detail but we can certainly see that it is something that deserves to be looked at further it seems and you you would imagine that it would be possible to design a relief which um couldn't be claimed by those who are not didn't really deserve it you know there are plenty of reliefs that are focused on housing associations or similar bodies or whatever so it shouldn't really be too difficult to make it um foolproof Um, I just wanted to continue uh, with the comparison of, of Newcastle and Edinburgh. Uh, maybe just a variation on that theme, but it seems to me that any developer will look at an, you know, a, a large range of, of uh, issues when making that decision. I mean, the price of land, for example, must be a consideration and in inevitably be variable across the whole country, whether you're building in Shetland or Dumfries or Newcastle or Edinburgh, um, in addition to the cost of building materials, the cost of transport and so on. There's an awful lot of other things um, that must be taken into consideration. Rather than I mean, listening, we would think that, that it's just this uh, tax relief 
that's become really important. But in the greater scheme of things, surely it's, it, it can't be such um, a big consideration. If all the other ducks are lined in a row, let's say. Um, I, I believe it comes down to the margins, really. So um, although the land may be cheaper in one location rather than another, that's factored into the model and the price at which the development, the finished development is sold sort of takes that into, into account. Um, but if you introduce a tax charge in one jurisdiction which isn't in another, then that eats up the margin. Um, so, you know, it, it means that there isn't a level playing field. That's why there was such a degree of concern about the removal of subsell relief across the board from um, LBTT. Okay. I think people appreciated the, the reasons for it, but there was a lot. Of, that's why there was such a lot of concern about it in development projects. Do you, just finally, do you accept that there was such a lot of concern also from HMRC and in redesigning the tax form that that actually was one of the biggest loopholes? In yes. tax avoidance, and that that, tight, that that tightening up these loopholes was it was seen as really a key importance, and also given that Westminster seemed to have followed um, the Scottish government's uh, changes that it's made in in some areas, uh, that that it could change elsewhere too, and that these reliefs may actually not be available in Newcastle in due course. Um, the thing is that uh, the UK government considered subsoil relief uh, in in relation to SDLT and taking into account um, all of, of what, what they knew about avoidance and all the rest of it, nevertheless decided to continue to have subsoil relief in SDLT. So in SDLT there is subsoil relief for any subsoil transaction. Um, it's been the rules have been tightened up. You have to claim it now. Um, but it is available for all transactions. So um, that, that there is quite a difference between um, LBTT and SDLT in that respect. So for a similar transaction um, af after April, you pay LBTT in Scotland, you won't pay SDLT on the same transaction in the rest of the UK. So it is, that's why it's very important that we do have this development subsidy relief, you know, the targeted relief for transactions where it's where it's terribly important, um, without creating a vehicle for avoidance, which I'm sure we haven't done, or we won't have done, assuming that this order is is passed. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. That has concluded the deliberations of the committee. Um, so I'd like to th thank you very much for your evidence uh, this morning. I'm just going to call a one minute. Um, uh, recess while we have a, a change of witnesses and then we'll go straight into the next session.
Okay, folks, we've still got another 11 items on our agenda, so let's uh, fire away. Uh, agenda item four um, is, is an item to evidence on the land and building transaction tax, tax rates and tax ban Scotland Order 2015 draft from Philip Hogg uh, of Homes for Scotland and John Hamilton of the Scottish Property uh, Federation. I'd like to welcome our witnesses once again to the Finance Committee. Uh, members of the committee have copies of written submissions from witnesses. So, as in the previous session, we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And as you're aware, um, I always start with the questions and then we'll open it out to colleagues around the table. So, let's see. First of all, the submission from Homes for Scotland. Good a place to start as any. I notice in the, the second page of this submission, there's a comment that an English family moving for what reasons and I guess they're thinking, why should they be penalised for moving to Scotland um, uh, in terms of LBTT? But would, would they really be penalised? I mean, I mean, the average price of a detached house in Scotland is £170,000. I think it's much the same in England. And it's £510,000 in London. So you'd pay a colossal amount more tax, surely, if you lived in London and moved to Scotland. And is it not the case that uh, under the proposals... Uh, currently, the Scottish Government have anyone buying a house under £392,000 will pay less tax than they paid before December of this year, of last year, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing I'd like to say is that, um, that we, uh, our members welcome the new system, the new progressive tax system, I think, is, is a massive improvement on, on where we were. So, I'm coming here today being complimentary rather than critical. However, um, we have always maintained in our submissions and in oral evidence that we need a fully functioning housing market that allows movement up and down the scale. That's been a consistent line that we've always maintained. The other point I'd like to make is that um, Scotland has a housing crisis that no one really seems yet to have taken consideration of. Audit Scotland has said that we need to build 500,000 homes in the next 20 years. That's 25,000 each and every year. Last year, we built 15,000, the lowest since 1947. We have a major problem here. And the, the, whilst, of course, today we're talking about LBTT and, and addressing all of the, the stamp duty levels, we have to promote a healthy housing market. And that is, is, is the basis on which our members have, have provided me evidence. Now, rather than me submit a dry submission, what I sought to do in the evidence I've provided you today is an unedited, um, completely authentic view of member feedback that I received upon the latest announcements. So I, I don't seek to sort of uh, justify each and every sentence within here, but it is provided to you as is, so you, you get a real sense of what's happening. There is, as we move up into the, the prices above 325, 350, around about that sort of level, there is a very steep increase in the amount of tax payable in Scotland compared to south of the border. That, that, that is a fact, that the figures show that. And what our members are saying is that they think that that is, uh, that is too steep too quickly and it could be better evened out if that 5% tax ban were broadened out from where it is at the moment to a little bit further. That's what we're calling for. We think it will promote a healthier market. We think it would allow much more movement, much more fluidity in the market, and um, all in all, provide a better tax system and a better tax break. The contrary of that is we do have genuine concerns that that market above 350, between 500,000 and possibly higher, will start to stagnate. And I think that what we have to bear in mind is that home moving is largely a discretionary choice that people make in those sort of price brackets. Many of them don't have to move. It's, it's, a, it's a decision that they make, and they can equally not make that decision. And that was partly the reason why we had the housing crisis of a few years back, is that, yes, mortgages became more difficult, absolutely, but also people were very, very concerned about taking on bigger commitments, about moving, and about their job security. So I think that given the context, as I've said, of the, we have a real housing crisis that we need to tackle, and you know we really need to be talking about how we're going to solve the housing crisis, and I have a lot of sympathy with, with David that provided evidence before about the need to address mid-market as well as all tenures, I think that you know we should be looking at what can we do to, keep, to get the housing market back so that we're housing all of our population across all tenures, and hence the reason that's, that's the basis of our submission. It has to be said, I don't think anyone uh, 
considers that um, you know stamp duty was a major uh, factor in terms of the slowdown in the housing market over the last few years. I mean, I don't think anyone would seriously consider that. <coughs> Um, there's a whole variety of reasons, as we all know, um, you know, uh, what those are. There's no point in getting into them in any great detail. But one of the things that did cause difficulty was house price inflation. House price inflation, year in, year out, um, was much higher than the increase in wages. And, of course, we ended up with a, a bubble. One would have thought that if there are significant tax um, impositions on the purchase of large houses that in itself would have a counter-inflationary impact on house prices. Therefore, would that not make houses more affordable overall rather than less if there is a reasonable tax imposed upon them? Not only does it bring in revenue for the Scottish Government, but if you were actually, for example, to remove taxation from some, you know, uh, from the Mies large houses, would it not just lead to greater house prices, and no one would really benefit in terms of the general public because everybody would have to pay more for houses that already in many parts of Scotland, or not many, but in some parts of Scotland, Aberdeen and Edinburgh, we'll no doubt hear a bit more of, um, chronically overpriced already. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that there is um, uh, that housing prices do need to be brought back closer to the affordability levels. Absolutely no, no issue with, with that at all. But I think the best way of addressing what is classically a supply and demand issue is to resolve the supply situation um, by adjusting taxation levels, as I've said, with a largely discretionary move. Some people will simply say, well, if that means the price of my property that I'm currently living in has gone down, I therefore may decide simply not to move. And therefore, that creates the stagnation that, that, that we're talking about. Uh, people, as I say, unless they're moving for personal reasons or job relocation, many people will simply say, well, it's easier to just stay where we are if the price of our property has, on, in theory, devalued, then, um, that, then that's not promoting the healthy market that we're looking for. Um, and we do need that healthy market. Again, as, as we have an ageing population, and maybe with people, uh, maybe older people that maybe have equity in their homes or maybe living in larger family homes than they necessarily need as they reach later stages of life and could consider downsizing. Um, again, if they see property prices declining, they may decide that it's just not palatable. So we're not concerned with building homes and that will make them more affordable if the prices are lower rather than higher. Sorry, I, I don't know. Sorry, I'm just saying, you're talking about, you know, people might not decide to move, but I mean, if other people who want to enter a market who are aspirational, uh, if the house price that they would have to pay is less for, for example, a new home because in house inflation is less, then would that not boost you, the industry and indeed help your members? The, the, the best way of boosting supply is to tackle the land, the lack of land availability in the planning process. As I said, the best way to address affordability and pricing is to resolve the supply demand equation, which simply, as you can see from the figures I quoted you earlier on, is so far out of kilter that fiddling with taxes is not going to make a significant impact on the supply demand or the house price scenario, I would argue. Okay. Uh, Mark wanted to come in with a brief su yeah, su supplementary. It, it, it follows on from what you're saying, Camille. I'm, I'm struggling with the logic here that you, you say you're in agreement that there needs to be uh, um, a reality brought about in terms of pricing of housing and, and, and the market needs to be much more affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, it strikes me, therefore, that coming to the committee and saying that we need to increase the value, uh, the increase the threshold for the 5% band onto higher value properties, when what you seem to conversely be arguing for is a much greater supply of um, more affordable properties below the probably below the 250,000 uh, band. Those don't seem to me to match up in terms of what you seem to be aspiring to. If, if what you're saying is we need to be providing more houses below the £250,000 rate, that shouldn't then be of any consequence in terms of where the bandings are because those are properties which under LBTT will pay less in terms of tax. I, I didn't argue for more properties below 250,000. I said we needed more homes across the board, including, my colleague was arguing before, more mid-market, more socially rented. We need more homes at all stages, all parts of the market. And uh, we simply don't have that at the moment. But, but, but <coughs> at the moment, there is no part of Scotland where the average house price, the average house price is above, is going to pay more uh, under LBTT 
than it did under stamp duty because it's not until you get, as the convener said, way above £300,000 that you're going to see people paying more compared to previously. And there's nowhere in Scotland that that is the average house price. So, again, I'm not entirely sure how that meets what you're saying in terms of increasing supply. Um, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, let, let me quote you. The, there's one quite large example in there, which, which I think is quite significant that, that I, I think might help illustrate it. The majority of the housing in Scotland, new build housing, is provided by the large volume UK-wide home builders who will typically provide products at the entry level, lower entry level of the market, the sort of prices that, that you, you maybe recall. The, the small, medium-sized home builders that tend to operate in more rural or secondary locations outside of the big conurbations uh, have almost halved in number as a result of the recession. Um, we desperately need to encourage these home builders back into the marketplace. And I know that there's some work being started by Scottish Government to address this. So we, we welcome that, that recognition that we need to bring these people back. These smaller home builders typically will be providing higher value properties um, and they're operating on a smaller scale. So their operational costs are a lot higher. And I think that example I provided in there was that sort of larger example was from a smaller home builder operating in Fife, providing uh, aspirational family homes. And he's saying, as, as there are others that I have similar evidence for, there's another one in the borders that has just lost a sale, uh, priced a property at 425000 which represents 10% of their turnover, saying that these are the discretionary purchases that are now starting to drop away. And one sale... On, on that sort of level can make a massive difference to these smaller home builders. Now, if we don't get those people back providing capacity in the marketplace, then increasingly we've got a smaller supply chain and we will n never get anywhere near the 25,000 homes a year that Audit Scotland tells us that we need. And therefore, we, we will never have any way of tackling the house price issue. So all of these things are interconnected. I'd point out that under the Scottish Government proposal will be a £53 million less tax will be uh, re recouped than was previously uh, the case in a given year. So there, uh, there, ha there is a significant reduction in the amount of tax that is going to be paid by people buying houses relative to the previous year. But just switching to Mr uh, Hamilton, I mean, you say the average price for detached property in Edinburgh, you know, is 394000 which is 2000 more than a figure I quoted that everyone would be better off. Um, under um, what proportion of houses in Scotland sell for that amount of money or more? Well, I think a key point for us is the, the proportion of houses which contribute to the tax that's generated. So we haven't focused particularly on the average house price across the board because it gives a slightly distorted picture in terms of the amount of revenue that's, that's generated in any particular sector or category. Um, we have made the point that you know 8% of residential transactions are expected to account for 75%. Um, the principle involved there is, is, is quite a small proportion of the market that's contributing a very large proportion of the, the tax that's generated. Um, from the start, in our consideration of the position of the the new proposals that were being put forward, we understood the need for some uh, neutrality in terms of the revenue that was generated previously against the revenue that's generated under the, the new proposals. Um, you've made the point that the estimate in the current, with the current proposal is there would be a slight reduction in that, but as I understand that that would be expected and it would be hoped that that difference would be closed in future years so that there isn't a long-term shortfall in the revenue that's uh, attracted by, by this new tax system. Um, if that's not the case and, and there's part of the market isn't operating effectively, then in the long term there could be a shortfall to the Scottish Government in terms of the, re the revenue that's attracted. I think, you know, in a sense, there's, there's an element of us wanting the, the same thing, which is a stable market which operates effectively at all levels and allows people who may be in a position 
selling, uh, whether this is a new build or uh, resale properties, if someone's in a position where they have to make a choice about selling their property, they may be dissuaded from putting that property on the market. If you're selling your house, you're not actually paying any tax. It's only the purchaser that's paying it. But you may be mortgaged. Uh, you may have bought you know, at a certain level. You may have a high mortgage. You may be getting advice that the cost of selling that house to a new purchaser is, is just not going to work in that, in that equation. So those properties may not come to the market. But surely the whole market must have been stimulated with the fact that, you know, a year ago you would have paid seven and a half, or six months ago you'd have to pay seven and a half thousand pound stamp duty on a quarter million pound house. You'll now have to pay two thousand two hundred. That's but, but a five thousand. I'm not talking about the two the two hundred. Yeah, I'm aware of that, house. but surely this whole the whole market must have been boosted by this by this. The fact that overall there's a fifty three million reduction in tax that's about to be paid. I mean and you're focusing on a very small I mean, where's the evidence that there's actually going to be a significant reduction in transactions or indeed houses being built at these costs? I mean to me there's a lot of assertion rather than actual uh, evidence that this is actually the case. I mean, we, we've seen, in, I mentioned London where house prices are absolutely sky high. I don't see the market having any, it collapsed there. What we've got is a lot of people who just can't afford to live anywhere more or less because of the uh, because of the sky high prices. And what, what I think we would have if, if, if what you suggested was brought in is all we'd have is higher house inflation. And no, more, fewer and fewer people able to buy these houses. I mean, no, that, that's, that's not the case. Um, I think we, we agree that it's not particularly healthy for the UK to have uh, prices which are too high in London and you know where the market is too active at the expense of other parts of the, the market or other parts of the country. Uh, what we would like to see is an improvement in market conditions and more house building in Scotland, or more property transactions generally in Scotland, you know, so that there's demand for property business to take place in Scotland outside of London. You know, I've heard this. Uh, London's been quoted, uh, you know, quite a lot this morning. Um, but London is a, is a good example in our minds in the situation where there's too much happening in that part of the country, and we would argue that we need to make Scotland more competitive. There's over demand in London for property. We don't have that situation in Scotland. We want to create the situation where there is demand in Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Glasgow, the major cities, but also in the, the more regional parts of Scotland and putting a higher burden of tax on all those areas will not improve Scottish competitiveness. Oh, okay. okay, if each of your proposals were actually implemented uh, as you've suggested, what would be the revenue implications do you, do you think? I mean, there seems to be a suggestion that, that it wouldn't actually impact on revenue because there'd be more transactions. Is that your view? Well, our, uh, again, we were satisfied with the, the principle of uh, you know, the 5% rate being introduced to the, to the proposals. Um, we haven't suggested quite such a high figure as Homes for Scotland did, but the, the mm -hmm. principle of moving the band up from 3 to 5 is important because as it stands at the moment, we think that uh, will lead to a distortion in the market where house builders and, for that matter, homeowners will be looking at a very, very narrow band of pricing where houses will come to the market at the expense of larger properties which, which will know it. Um, so I think the principle of what we've considered here is very much the same. Um, the numbers are slightly different, although we, we do agree on the, the rates which have been set. We're slightly at odds, I think, on the, on the band, but the band of a £75,000 band between 250000 and 325000 in an important part of the market is too narrow. OK, now, Mr Hogg, you, you've suggested half a million rather than 400000 Have you done any figures to suggest how that would impact on the revenue? Um, we, we haven't made any calculations on all of that um, I, because I think that what we're talking about um, is we're all trying to forecast the future and um, mm -hmm. I, I make no claims of being any better at doing that than, than the next person but what we are bringing to uh, to our uh, 
case today is um, our first-hand experience of dealing with home buyers at the sharp end and our members' first-hand experience. Uh, so we're talking buyer behaviour uh, and we're all trying to second-guess what might happen in the event of these, these new rates being put in. So what I can bring to you today is the evidence that we have from our members, the evidence we have from potential home buyers, and that was the reason why I thought I would give you verbatim comments of what's happening on the ground. We're not economists, but we are telling you what people are saying to us and what their likely actions might be, and therefore our evidence is based on, on those, uh, th those forecasts. Okay, just one further question before we open out the session, and it's actually to yourself, Mr Hamilton, it's just about the... Um, the the non-residential rate. Um, we did ask Mr. Swinney about. I, I asked Mr. Swinney about this change from four percent to four and a half percent, and it's talking about a two million pound uh, and a two million pound development. He didn't. He was not of the view that a half percent would make a difference in terms of deciding strategically whether you you, you made a, had a development in Scotland or not. Ten thousand pounds and a two million pound development. We uh, we covered this in the the last session, I think. Mm -hmm, yes. And, uh, I gave an example which was far higher. Most of the large, uh, well, all large-scale residential developments are now being undertaken by the major UK house builders. There are very, very few small house builders, either in Scotland or probably in England. You know, the SMEs, you know, as Philip has said, have, uh, have dwindled. So the market is now dominated by relatively small number of UK house builders, virtually all of whom have, if they have a presence in Scotland, they have a presence in England. And um, I don't agree that the, the issue uh, of competitiveness is one that should be ignored. Um, I give an example at the last, last session. We're typically house builders that my company deals with are selling land, not at £2 million, pounds, but in the 6 to 8 or £10 million price bracket. The people that are making the choices about whether they proceed with those transactions are largely based in England. And I know from personal experience in dealing with those companies that they will make a choice. They operate in their own companies. There's an element of competition in those companies about whether a development proceeds in Edinburgh or it proceeds in Newcastle. And, you know, there's one very large business located in Newcastle, which, you know, I don't have to name here, but I know that that company makes those choices. And another half percent uh, imposition of tax on that land file will come into the, the equation for that company. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to open out the session. John, to be followed by Mark. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Uh, very much. Um, Mr Hogg, to follow on, uh, one of the comments you made earlier on was about uh, land not being available. And I think that might apply in some areas, but I don't think it applies in all areas because in my constituency in the east end of Glasgow, we've got a lot of land, no problem with planning permission, and nobody wants to build on it despite the fact there's a housing need. I mean, at the end of my street, there's an area laid out, the roads are laid out, the street lighting's been on for 25 years, and nobody's building. Do you think tax could uh, get movement in some of that kind of land? Um, without knowing what the land is, and I'm, I'm not a developer, so I'm not going to assess the viability of any, any, any piece of land. Um, at, at the point I was trying to make in general is, is that whilst, whilst we need the tax system to work efficiently, it's only a very small part of a bigger market problem that we have. And as you said, in some parts of Glasgow, we don't have the right type of housing. In, 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 uh, in Aberdeen, we're finding that the market is racing away, and again, affordability is an issue. Um, planning process is, is a major problem and as I think has been referred to this morning, the Scottish Government is just in the process of, of, uh, of finalising a joint housing delivery action plan. Uh, I was at a meeting late last night working on some of the, uh, the land issues related in all of that. The reality is, is that there simply isn't enough land across the whole country to meet the Scottish housing needs. And even in places where there is enough land, the planning system is so painfully slow and, uh, and, and difficult to get through that we cannot progress the land at the rates that we need. So if we're looking to tackle house price affordability, that is where we should be directing, I would suggest, most of our, our efforts. But in some cases you do accept that 
there's land, there's planning permission, but still nobody's building. Uh, absolutely, and and the reasons for that, there, there could be a whole raft of reasons. It could be maybe there's no market for it, or maybe there are constraints on the site. Maybe the financial viability doesn't stack up. Mm -hmm. But, I, I, but I the don't... tax is probably not the major factor in that situation. You mean LBTT? It, well, yes, uh, the SR. Um, I, I, I've simply no idea, but no. I suspect probably not. It depends on the house prices. Okay. I mean, the example, kind of following on from that, you give uh, some bullet points with quotes, which is helpful. Uh, I mean, the second one, it's talking about £3,350. Uh, I think is, that probably means the tax. It says it just about, it was about, just about to cost me £3,350. However, the example is a house which might have cost 430,000 i think it's been bargained down to 400,000 mm -hmm. now the bargaining therefore has affected say 30,000 pounds which is about 7.5% of the total i guess that's not unusual the tax the 3350 is 0.8% of the total so i mean that suggests to me that in that example the tax is a very very small part and almost irrelevant um, whereas, really, when you bargain over a house price, that's where the big movement comes. Is that your understanding of that? I think I think that example goes to support John's case that with a, such a <coughs> high proportion of the total tax take under this new scheme being on a very small number of properties <coughs> or transactions, that example there shows the, the, the fragility of that case. Because if, let's suppose, a good number of those properties are then are negotiated, the prices are negotiated downwards and the corresponding tax comes from there, that would potentially leave a, a, a big hole in the uh, forecast tax take. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that, Mr uh, Hogg refers to yourself, Mr Hamilton, um, about, and that band that you feel is too narrow, the 250 to 325, um, I mean, if there was going to be a bit of bargaining in there, I mean, would you be happier if the band was wider, but say the 5% went up to 7%? Um, I think the, the numbers in, in that case, you know, we, as I said before, the, the principle of us, you know, to you know, a large extent, looking for the same thing here, which is a stable market, which generates, if it's not, you know, we can't predict exactly how much uh, business is going to be done, you know, next year or the year after, but, you know, what we are looking to do is to try and maintain the, the kind of budgetary conditions in which we can all operate our businesses. Um, I think uh, to an extent, you know, we, we make it over complicated again by bringing in yet another proposed tax rate. You know, we, uh, we've said that we feel that the 0%, 2, 5, 10 and 12 is probably now appropriate. And I would still make the point that what we should now look at is uh, the bands rather than the rates and ensure that there is enough market activity in each of these bands which generates the amount of revenue year after year in which you know, the government can see uh, tax revenue being generated and the property and housing industry can see stable business. But, I mean, you're in a market where bargaining is very much part of the, the whole equation. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're asking for a wider rate, reduced tax level. Is there nothing you're willing a, to a give in return? A wider band. Sorry? A wider band. A, a wider band, yeah. which means reduced tax take. Is there nothing you're willing to give in, in to balance that out? Uh, I, well, I think we, we are giving, um, you know, what, what we, we, the point that, you know, has conceded, been conceded from the, <clears> the start is that there has to be, uh, or there should be a similar uh, amount of tax being collected. Um, in a way, we're almost, almost arguing from the, the government side that we, we think there's a risk that that tax will not be collected. That's not good for the industry, though, because it's going to show that part of the market isn't functioning correctly and uh, there isn't a choice in the market in which, you know, not all of our members and not all of Homes for Scotland's members serve the same part of the market. You know, I, I suppose the extreme example just now is we've got uh, members in the Aberdeen area who have very, very difficult trading conditions in front of them, and the changes in legislation which are in front of them are making that worse. You know, and that's a combination of, you know, an unforeseen drop in oil revenues, which hadn't been 
factored in when you know these proposals came forward and the new tax rates themselves are making it extremely difficult for those businesses to to survive so i mean the other side of course is constituents like mine who think that you know if you spent more than 750,000 pounds in a yeah. house you are fabulously rich 12% is far too low yeah. you know let's go to 20% uh-huh. um but you you're not even willing to concede you know wider band higher rate anything like that no um as i say i think the the rates are probably set pretty much in the, in the right place now there may be some debate about whether it should be a 5 or 6% 5 and a half percent rate um the, the point we are making, though, is that the steps, you know, there's often, uh, you know, discussion about the, the housing ladder. And the importance of that is that the, the steps in the housing ladder have to be manageable. You know, people have to have the, the ability to make those steps. And if they don't, then they, they can be stuck there for a long time and, and the market doesn't op- operate effectively. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, the... Rates that we, we don't have a, a great issue with the rates, as I say, but you know you could, you know we would concede that there could still be some uh, room for negotiation around the the five the mid that mid rate there the five or six percent. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I'm I'm interested that in your in especially in paragraph two in your paper you look at detached properties uh, and you refer to that at least twice in Edinburgh and elsewhere. I mean, it strikes me. Certainly, I've got very few detached properties in my constituency. I mean, a mm-hmm. detached property is per se a luxury. Yeah. I mean, would you accept that? that nobody needs a detached property. It's not a necessity. I have lived in all sorts of properties in you know, my lifetime. Um, the housing market uh, tends to uh, address where there's, there's demand for housing. Um, that demand you know, has to be... It has to exist across the, the market, and as Philip said, that applies to mixed tenure, social rent, mid rent, private rent, and all levels of the, the housing market. But it still comes back to the the point about which part of the market is making the biggest tax contribution. So I, d- I don't want to sort of over egg that point, but if you put so much of the burden on one particular house tenure and house type, then you have to give some consideration, you know, as to the ability to sell that property. And if you don't sell that property, there will be an implication on the, the tax that's generated. The other side to that is that the people who need the tax are at the bottom end. Yes. I mean, is your paper and are you as an organisation basically arguing for the richer part of society? No, not, not, not at all. You know, the welcome elements of the, 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 the proposals are that uh, a larger part of the housing market has been removed from tax. And, you know, I, I'd like to well uh, welcome the, the changes that have been made in that respect. Um, it doesn't, though, you know, detract from the, the, the point that um, there is a larger market we don't feel that you know it's a, it's a case of penalising one part of the, the the market at the expense of others. What we, we would like to see is a fair tax system. Um, fairness comes into the you know always comes into the question of tax. At the the levels that have been set here, we don't believe it's fair and we don't believe it's uh, uh, it's appropriate for such a burden to be carried by. A small element of the tenure and house types are, are going to be sold. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. <coughs> Followed by Gavin. Thank you, convener. The other day, um, I uh, saw a friend of mine sharing on Facebook a, a property, a four-bedroom, uh, semi-detached family property in Bridge of Don in my constituency, located quite close to a local primary school. Obviously, a very desirable property offers over two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. I just think it's important to put that on record because I think we're re- straying into the realms of assuming that you can't get a family-sized property in my constituency or in Aberdeen uh, at, at that kind of uh, at that kind of price. I'm struggling with some of the evidence we're getting today, uh, Mr. Hamilton. You seem to be suggesting that this um, 
th th these rates, which nobody is paying yet, um, are creating great difficulties for businesses uh, in the northeast of Scotland. Pre uh, no, no. The, I've not said that the rates. You 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 mentioned it in combination with other factors. Yeah, the bans. I mentioned the bans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the bans. So, um, presumably, then you would be advising your members to um, be building properties at two hundred fifty thousand pound value or below. Because if what you're saying to this committee today is that house price purchases are going to be driven as a result of the rates that are being paid under the bandings, then there will be a rush of people seeking to purchase those properties because, as the convener has highlighted, they will pay significantly less than they would have paid under stamp duty. Yes, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but at the same point, uh, and one of the things which I'm, I'm interested by, technically nobody's paying more or less on this because the only point at which you pay stamp duty or land and buildings transaction tax is at the point of purchase. It's not an ongoing tax. So I paid stamp duty when I bought my house, um, but I've not paid it since. So I'm not paying that tax at present. The only time I will pay it is if I decide I want to buy another property. So it's not uh, it's not an ongoing tax as, for example, income tax. So surely it's misleading to, to, to portray it in those terms that people are paying more or less. People only pay it at the point at which they purchase a property. I'm struggling to, to see the point. Well, the, yeah. point, the point is that... Um, in terms of the grand scheme of what is driving the behaviour of house purchasers, I'm struggling to conceive that this is the, the, the primary motivation. If people are looking to upscale to a larger property, then that will be driven by a whole range of factors. And most people, if they're buying a property at the, at the rate mm -hmm. um, uh, here, will have the ability to pay that uh, as part of the pr purchase, particularly if, as is highlighted in the Homes for Scotland submission, they've managed to uh, negotiate a £30,000 reduction in the purchase price in some of these instances because the home home, sa home seller is making yeah, that. I'm, I'm you know, really struggling with the idea that you know people have no concern about paying tax. You know, people. I didn't say they have no concern about paying tax. Yeah, it's whether it's paid once or whether it's paid annually, you know, no matter what uh, uh, the uh, frequency of that pa uh, tax is due to be paid, it will have an influence in people's choice on what type of property they buy, and it would also influence the type of property that's brought to the market. So, from Mr. Hogg, from your perspective, uh, are you detecting um, a change in market behaviour currently as a result of the introduction, the future introduction of these bans? When you say market behaviour, who purchases? Who, yes. To to what extent? To the extent that um, the fee anecdotal feedback that I have is that the higher price properties, um, the market has slowed down significantly since these rates have been announced. But that's interesting because surely um, these rates are not yet active yet. Surely if, that, if, if it were the case that behaviour were to be driven by this, you would expect to see sales taking place in advance of the rates but being the, introduced but the reality and sales is being brought forward as a <coughs> consequence. As, you, as you'll know yourself, the house moving process is not a short, it's not the sort of thing you do over a weekend. Um, anyone setting out and making a decision today to purchase a new home, realistically they're in for a probably three to six month process. So anyone deciding today that they wanted to buy a new home has got, I would say, virtually no chance of purchasing before these new tax rates are introduced. But the rate, um, the, if you'll forgive me for the rates were previously... Um, announced, the, the, the previous rates were announced in November in terms of the yes. initial consultation. Now, n that, that's still, that's more than three months, three to four months before, yes. but, but about six months before they would become live. Um, so at that point, did at, you at, notice? Did at you notice at, at that point, we saw an acceleration of people wanting to conclude sales. Those that would have been disadvantaged from April, we saw a rush of people wanted to conclude sales early. But now that we've come to this side of the year where the realistically no one setting out on a sale for a purchase from January probably could have completed before that point. That, so since then the market has gone, we're told, has gone a lot quieter on those higher value properties. And do you anticipate, I mean, I notice in, in one of these that, um, you, again, this is the, my, my concern around the way that this is being portrayed, that you have uh, one of your developers suggesting that people are being penalised for moving to Scotland, which I don't think is 
is, is, is helpful language to use. Presumably by that same token, I as, if I as a first time buyer were to go south of the border, I'd be penalised for moving to England because I would pay a higher rate under stamp duty than I would pay under LBTT. So are you anticipating movement? If you're, if you're anticipating a lack of people moving to Scotland at the higher end because they would pay more in tax, are you anticipating a higher rate of people moving to Scotland at the lower end because they'll pay less? Um, well, the first thing I should say that these, as I say, these are verbatim comments. So whether you like what people are saying is that's how they feel and that's their experience. So, I, you know, I make no apology for giving you verbatim comments rather than trying to couch up what, uh, what, what I think our members are talking about. I think what one, one factor that, that maybe you need to take into consideration is that as a general rule, not always, but as a general rule, people purchasing higher value properties tend to be more mobile in terms of their career, uh, maybe more senior levels in organisations, so they tend to move around maybe a little bit more, have the opportunity to round, move around a little bit more, tend to relocate. And we have heard examples of you know senior people looking to move not only themselves, but then to bring colleagues along, set up departments, businesses, divisions. Um, and if the main person decides that, you know, hey, I'm not going to move there, I could, using the example we've had to you today, I'm going to move to Newcastle rather than Edinburgh. Not only does, d does that person uh, not move with all the corresponding tax benefits, but also their, their colleagues um, who they would subsequently employ do, do not follow them as, as well. So, you know, there is, there's quite a long chain of events that, that, that happen. Okay. Um, okay, you're not economists, as you said, but I mean, what is, what is your best estimate and what the likely market impact will be on the uh, Scottish housing market uh, after the 1st of April if this uh, regulation is passed today and these are the actual rates and bans uh, that happen in April? I, I think that we will see a, a prolonged period of below average activity in that, that section of the market. That's not to say it will stop because it won't. Some people have to move. I think we'll see suppressed levels of activity in that marketplace. Um, and as I say, it's discretionary movement generally at that sort of level. So people will say, well, if that's what it means, I'll choose to stay where I am. And I think also what we will see, as I've tried to, to, to explain in here, is we'll see a disproportionate effect onto small and medium-sized home builders who have to build, well, sorry, that's not true, who are more likely to build at those higher prices because they cannot compete with the larger home builders, the larger volume home builders. They don't have the economies of scale. So as you see in the examples there, uh, I think some one of them has said, you know, that's the market he aims at. It's a small five-based company, probably builds 20 homes a year, something of that scale. He will be disproportionately hit because he can't compete with the larger volume guys on the the entry level products, the sort of the below the 250 market, and um, he will he will start he will see that effect that impact. So that takes more capacity at the marketplace, and it takes homes away. And those people that might have bought at the 400,000 may decide that they you know that they'll they'll stay where they are and not release a property for more entry level product. Um, I agree with uh, you know Philip's uh, points there, but also uh, I think you know it's important to see the uh, differentiation in the, in the housing market between the new build market and uh, the existing sales market. Um, most uh, sales and tax revenue, therefore, is is generated from the sale of existing property. But the importance of the new build market to the economy can't be ignored you know, because of the massive shortfall that we have in the, the number of houses that are being built and the, and the wider economic implications of that and the lack of uh, business activity that goes around that gap. You know, in Scotland, we should be aiming to be building 25 to 30,000 new built houses a year. Um, we're struggling to build somewhere between 11 or 12,000 houses at the moment. Um, I think generally the implication of making it less attractive for a house builder to look at the full range of new housing which you might bring to the market is 
would be a, a detriment to, to that position and it wouldn't uh, generate more house building activity which in the wider economy I think is, is key. Okay. Um, let, let's assume, Mr Orglin, your, your best estimate comes to pass and there is, I think, to use your words, a depressed level of activity on that section of the market. I think, uh, you know, th I think you were referring specifically to 325 to 500, but presumably it would apply to properties above that as well, potentially. Let, let's assume that happens. Does that section of the market in, exist in a vacuum or will that then have an impact on other parts of the housing market and the houses at uh, lower values in the 325? Well, I think that we've often referred to the, the sort of the concept of the housing ladder of, uh, as a generalisation. People through their different life stages, you know, will move from maybe moving from the family to the first one bedroom flat, and when a family comes along, look for something a little bit bigger. And you know, th that that is is a well proven um, path, albeit not as scientifically accurate for everyone. But we talk about progression through. Um, if we if we find that there's a lack of product available suitable product available at the higher levels then clearly that means then that those that can and want to move upwards they'll have fewer opportunities to do so and where properties are available again we come back to our classic supply and demand if there is only one four bedroom property at a certain price range available that suits that purchaser then you know the, the seller has the opportunity to to bargain on the price so in, if we're looking about house price inflation then I, I think that you know having a market that doesn't move fluid fluidly um, isn't going to help tackle house price infl inflation. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, do you share that view? What's your thought? Yes, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, <coughs> certainly you know a point we've come back to more than once where um, the market would operate most effectively where there is a fair demand for it which is generated by the wider uh, attractiveness of living and working in that area. Um, you know, we fundamentally don't think it's helpful to have more severe differentiation or too severe a differentiation. We accept the point, you know, that people generally who are buying houses, more expensive houses, should generally be able to afford it. But you know, people often you know they are heavily mortgaged. They are, in many cases, in that side of the market, people who are starting businesses and are making contributions to the economy. That applies both in terms, as we say, specifically to this tax that's been generated in that part of the housing market, but also to those people who will make contributions to the uh, to the business economy. Okay, and and the way to get a, a better functioning or, or optimal functioning housing market, in your respective views, then, is to make the changes to the bans uh, that you've submitted in your written evidence. Yes, I believe so. The the um, the widening of that five percent band, I think, would um, make what I and I, I reiterate my opening comments. I welcome the new system, and I welcome where we are compared to where we were this time last year. We're coming here today to genuinely provide our advice. You invited us here to provide our advice based on our members' experience, based on the market with them. We're bringing you that genuinely and with a, with a suggestion that that 5% band, if it was broadened up to circa 500,000, we think it would, uh, it would go a long way to creating a better, uh, more robust tax system. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I just uh, wanted perhaps a wee bit of explanation, um, Mr Hogg, on, I, and I'm quoting, I think correctly, I'm sure the clerks will tell me if not, simply isn't enough land across all of Scotland to satisfy housing needs. Yes. And can you say what you mean by that? Enough, uh, enough land where or... Yes, e every local authority has to uh, provide a five-year effective land supply um, without boring you with the intricate details, but only a handful of local authorities do have an effective five-year land supply. Um, this is to say this was a meeting I was at late, late last night, and we've, we've long argued that um, shortage of land, shortage of raw material, you know, any basic economics will tell you, will we'll drive the price upwards. So we have, to, we have to 
ensure there's enough land, effective land, where people want to live that can be developed, um, that will then start to tackle the housing shortage and ultimately then impact on, on, uh, on, on prices, house prices. But it's not a shortage of housing, house building land that's, that's holding up house building at the moment, or you would say? Um, I would say that, yes, that is, it is a shortage. Because, the, because there isn't enough land, that affects the price of the land and it affects the availability. Okay. And would you say that that's common across all of the UK? Um, yes, it is. And I, I fully recognise that um, that home building can be very contentious at local level. It can be very difficult at local level. Um, it's interesting to see the UK politi political parties all talking about, in the run-up to the general election, we're going to build 200,000, we're going to build 300,000. And, you know, it's great that there is a recognition that more home building is needed. However, translating that top target to then saying, oh, and by the way, we're going to now build 50 of those just around the corner. All of a sudden, everyone that signed up to that uh, that that need is then it's that bit more little bit difficult. Um, but it, it's an issue that's not going to go away. We have a growing and aging population. We're simply not building enough to house our population, and that is is a sad sad reflection. That is, is an issue that subsequent governments and I make no political point here. Subsequent governments have failed to recognise and grasp with. We're here today spending two hours talking about tweaks to a tax system, but I'd much much more welcome spending two hours saying how we're going to address the housing crisis in Scotland. We're not having that discussion, and that's really where we should be spending mm. two hours talking today. So the problems are really much bigger than, than the tax Absolutely and the tax ban. Absolutely. It pales into insignificance, it? Does pales it? into insignificance. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, John and Philip for coming along again today. Thanks very much for your evidence. It's very much appreciated. Um, I'm going to, as we've been in session now for one tour, I'm going to call a break until 11.45 to give members a natural break, as we still have another uh, 10 items on our agenda. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.
Okay, we agreed to start back at 11.45, so that's what we will now do. Our next item of business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy on two statutory instruments relating to land and buildings transaction tax. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by Neil Ferguson, Alison Cumming and John St Clair of the Scottish Government. I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary uh, to the meeting and uh, ask him to make an opening statement explaining the instruments and remind him not to move the motions at this point. Thank you, Kavir. The purpose of the. Do you wish me, Kavir, to give an opening statement in relation to both orders or both orders? Okay. The primary purpose of the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Subsale Development Relief and Multiple Dwellings Relief Scotland Order 2015 is to provide for a relief from Land and Buildings Transaction Tax in relation to land transaction involving subsale arrangements, but only where the development of the land in question is in prospect. The work to development the provisions in this order followed a number of meetings of a working group involving industry professionals and, and tax specialists, which was convened to explore the issues associated with a subsale development relief. And I'd like to place on record my thanks to those who participated in this exercise. Given the experiences of subsale rules applicable to stamp duty land tax, my core considerations in the design of this relief have been to ensure that the relief supports economic activity in the form of property development whilst not supporting land speculation and minimising any risk of tax avoidance activity. Members may recall that I made these points during the passage of the Bill and placed my position on this subject on record during Stage, stage 3 debate on the 25th of June 2013. To achieve these aims, a consultation paper was published in June 2014 seeking views on draft regulations that would introduce a subsale development relief where the full tax due would be paid by the first buyer in a subsale arrangement and then, provided significant development of the site had taken place within five years, the relief would be claimed and the tax return by Revenue Scotland on receipt of a tax return. However, the consensus of the responses to the consultation was that to help with cash flow and development transactions, the relief should be available at the outset. If development was not completed within the five-year period, the relief could be clawed back. Otherwise, the industry argued, Developers in Scotland would be placed at a disadvantage in terms of cash flow in comparison with their competitors in other parts of the United Kingdom. This issue has been addressed in the revised regulations that are now before Parliament and the subject of the committee's discussions today. This order provides uh, for relief which has a number of features. Firstly, it will only be available to the first buyer in a transaction involving subsale arrangements where significant development is in prospect and the order defines significant development. As has always been envisaged, the relief is available to the first buyer when the whole site is sold to a second buyer. Partial relief is available where part of the site is retained by the first buyer and the remainder is sold to a second buyer or further partitioned to other buyers. To be clear, no relief is available for that proportion of the site that is retained by the first buyer. However, the relief is restricted to the first buyer only. It is not available to a second or subsequent buyer where there is a series of subsale arrangements in place. This reduces the risk of tax avoidance and is an, import, an improvement on the corresponding arrangements relating to stamp duty land tax. Recognising the concerns of the development industry, the relief is to be claimed and granted at the point when the land transaction return is submitted by the first buyer. Revenue Scotland may request specific evidence to be provided uh, by the first buyer that the claim is valid. Um, uh, for example, that there are, no, there are firm plans to undertake significant development. Um, lastly, if significant development does not take place within five years, the leaf is withdrawn or partially withdrawn, the tax that should have been paid uh, would then become repayable. I'm confident that this relief will provide a robust mechanism that provides appropriate safeguards for the property development industry in Scotland, uh, balanced with the need to protect the revenue and to maintain a, position, a firm position on tax avoidance. In addition, the relief has been discussed in detail with Revenue Scotland. Administration of the relief will have implications in terms of checking that significant development has indeed taken place and of recovering the relief where this is not the case, which will increase administrative costs for Revenue Scotland in due course. Uh, taken in the round, though, my view is that this represents an appropriate balance between equity, collection of revenue and administrative effort. And finally, on this question, convener, this order also amends paragraphs 11 and 12 of Schedule 5 to the Act for multiple dwellings relief to ensure 
that the calculation using the minimum prescribed amount of 25% applies only to the acquisition of multiple dwellings, not multiple dwellings and other property. Under the drafting as enacted, it was felt that there might be ambiguity on this important point, which was undesirable and which, subject to Parliament's agreement, it will now be clarified. This order also makes a consequential change to provide that the minimum proportion prescribed in the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Prescribed Proportion Scotland Order 2014, which has already been considered by the Committee, it stays in force on the amended basis. Um, in moving now, Convener, to the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, Tax Rates and Tax Bans Scotland Order 2015, the primary purpose of this order is to set tax bans and percentage tax rates for land transactions that will be subject to land and buildings transaction tax. The instrument sets these rates and bans for residential property transactions for non-residential property transactions and with respect to leases, tax rates for each band applicable to chargeable consideration which consists of rent. The Scottish Parliament legislated for a marginal progressive rate structure for LBTT back in 2013. This was intended to replace the much criticised slab structure of stamp duty land tax, which was shown to cause distortions in the housing market around the tax thresholds. The reform was recently replicated across the United Kingdom, although for residential transactions only, following the reforms to SDLT, which the Chancellor announced in the autumn statement. I set out the Scottish Government's proposed rates and bans for LBTT in the budget last October, an updated Parliament on planned residential rates and bans during the Stage 1 debate on the Budget Bill in January. I made clear to Parliament last October that I intended for the devolved taxes to be revenue neutral in their first year of operation. The Government did not want uh, to raise any more or less than the two devolved taxes um, would have raised had the UK taxes remained in place, and we wish to maintain devolved spending at planned levels. Of course, at the time of the draft budget, we still had to reach agreement with the UK Government on the block grant adjustment for the devolved taxes, despite two years of effort in this respect. The LBTT rates and bans presented in this order, taken with the proposed rates of landfill tax, are designed to be revenue neutral against the block grant adjustment in aggregate, as I set out to the Committee in my letter of the 22nd of January and in the Chamber on the 4th of February. The Scottish Government forecasts that we will generate revenue of £381 million from LBTT in 2015-16, 235 of which will come from residential property transactions and £146 million from non-residential property transactions, including the taxation of leases. These forecasts have been endorsed as reasonable by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. As the Committee is aware, work is continuing on the estimation of the revenue losses arising from forestalling and the Scottish Government's will, estimates will be su subject to review by the Commission. The impact of forestalling on the block grant adjustment also remains to be agreed with the United Kingdom Government. I will now turn to the policy objectives underlying the decisions which I have taken on the three sets of LBTT rates and bans presented in this order. In setting the rates and bans of tax payable on residential property transactions, I have sought to prioritise support for first-time buyers and those progressing through the housing market by redistributing the tax burden from lower to higher value transactions. These rates are consistent with the principle that taxes should be proportionate to the taxpayer's ability to pay. The nil rate threshold is set at £145,000, which will take around 50% of house purchases out of tax altogether. 10,000 more purchases than under the new rates of UK SDLT. The marginal rate of 5%, which I announced in January, and which is to apply to the value of a purchase between 250 and £325,000, also ensures that the tax due on over 90% of transactions will either be less than the UK charge or will be zero. Turning to non-residential property transactions, these rates and bans are designed to ensure that Scotland remains an attractive location for business investment. They will reduce the tax charge for the majority of transactions below £2 million, ensuring that the tax due on around 95% of transactions will be the same or lower than the SDLT charge. And finally, the rates and bans for non-residential leases are set to ensure parity with the UK rates, which are also set on a progressive basis. Convener, I consider that these rates and bans demonstrate very clearly that the Scottish Government has placed fairness, equity and the ability to pay at the very heart of the first decisions that we have taken on national tax rates.
Thank you very much for that cabinet session. One of the reasons why this session started about 45 minutes later than was scheduled was because we're obviously taking evidence from a number of uh, uh, witnesses with regard to uh, these uh, items. Um, I'm just uh, going to ask you one or two questions before I open out to colleagues around the table. And the first one is really that in the evidence that was presented to us earlier um, this morning, we were advised by um, Homes for Scotland and the Scottish Property Federation that in their view, the, ba the banned um, restriction of 5% from a quarter of a million to 325,000 uh, is actually likely to lead to market distortions for more uh, expensive properties, particularly those in the 325,000 to 400,000 pound range, although uh, Homes for Scotland would like to see that band widen to half a million pounds. I'm just wondering if you have any views on what impact, because some of the evidence suggested that there has been an adverse impact on transactions in that price band um, as a result of the announcements being made. The, the only published data we have, Convener, is for the fourth quarter of 2014 in relation to um, property transactions. That's the, the data from Registers of Scotland on uh, property transactions and property prices. Um, and um, th there is nothing, uh, obviously, th the, the volatility in the market um, or in the issues with which we are wrestling um, only crystallised for a limited period of that time. Obviously, I set out rates in October, um, but the UK government's changes were announced in early December, so I, I don't think we're getting a, a, a particularly reliable period of analysis. Um, but there is nothing in that data that strikes me as being, as, as, as indicating there is a particular change in the pattern of property transactions. Obviously, we'll consider very carefully the further statistics that emerge from Registers of Scotland as that information becomes available for the whole of quarter one, 2015. Uh, one further point, actually, uh, in, in terms of the Scottish uh, Property Federation, they raised concerns about the non-residential rate. They said that the 4.5% uh, rate, as opposed to 4% in the UK, would be would actually have a detrimental effect on the likelihood of investment decisions being made to Scotland. Now, I put this to you some months ago, and you were of the view that it would not have, uh, in your view, any significant um uh, difference, but uh, we've been advised that uh, that, that uh, from personal experience, the Scottish Property Federation representative said that uh, he was of the view that in investments from six in the six to eight million pound range, this is having a potential impact. Uh, again, does the Scottish government get any detailed information as to whether or not that's the case, or whether they believe it will be the case? There's certainly no detailed information um, or any information on this point that has come to me, Convener. I think when we discussed these issues, I think it was um, in your constituency at the Finance Committee hearing on, uh, on the land of Arran, um, I, I set out some of the scenarios that would be relevant here. And for a £10 million transaction, the increase in the tax charge um, would be £40,250, which is 0.4% of the uh, the total uh, transaction value. And, and I do consider that a change of that level is at the margins of the assessment of that transaction. Um, but I am not uh, aware of any um, information that uh, in any way uh, contradicts what I said to you when we uh, discussed this issue um, in your constituency. Thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm going to open out the, the session now to colleagues, and uh, Deputy Convener will be first to be followed by Richard. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in the Chartered Institute of uh, Taxation uh, made comments about subsale uh, development relief, and this, this question of s the term significant development. Uh, that obviously if a significant development has happened within five years, uh, then tax would not be payable. Are we are we happy with the term significant development that it's not going to lead to a lot of wrangles and uh, court cases and things? Set out a definition of significant development within the order, Convener, which, um, and if I can quote in, um, in section 7 of Schedule 10A, um, 
significant development means development that is significant having regard to, among other things, the nature and extent of the subject matter of the qualifying subsale and to the market value of that subject matter. So there's, there's, there's a couple of points I would make about that. The first is that we have defined as clearly as we can um, what we would consider to be um, significant um, and that relates and in, takes into account the market value of the subject matter. It takes into it, uh, to consideration um, the nature and the extent of the development. So it, it, it re would require, um, you know, for example, if we took an example, let's say, um, where planning consent had been given for the building of a hundred houses in the development and one house had been built, then clearly it would fail the test of significant development. Now, if the committee will forgive me, I won't start to police where the line should be deployed because that brings me to my, my additional point, which is um, the, 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 the definition says, having regard to among other things, which is designed to give flexibility to Revenue Scotland to look reasonably and credibly at a situation. So if 99 houses have been built, then you know, I think without, without, without creating precedent in the committee today, that would feel to me as if significant development had undertaken. But if one had been built, then clearly it's not. And Revenue Scotland would have to judge in amongst uh, that range what was um, a sense of, and, and they would be taking into account market conditions and, and other factors. I think, uh, you know, without wishing to prescribe, and I think really prescription is about is the is the next place we could go to in that definition. We've tried to give as much clarity as we possibly can do, but these will these will ultimately be sub matters that are subject to debate yes. um, and determination by Revenue Scotland. Yes. Um, but we, we, we've set out, I think, enough detail to inform that judgment. Okay, and another point uh, kind of linked to that that CIOT made was um, if there were external events outside the control of the developer with the five years, would they be able to apply for an extension of that five years? Uh, no, they could not, no. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, Richard, to be followed by Gavin. Sorry, sorry, what? Can I? Yeah. Oh, son, I think you're winding up. But no, I'm just finished that. <laughs> just getting fired up while you join the air. That was just my introductory bit. Oh, yeah. oh. Um, I mean, the question of competitive advantage or disadvantage has been raised by a number of uh, witnesses. And I think I got a slightly confusing picture from the witnesses because some seemed to say that the tax was very, very important and would affect a development going forward or not. And others said, no, actually, the tax was only... A one part of it. I mean, how, how significant do you see the LBTT being on whether a residential development goes ahead or not? Or um, is it? do you see it as other factors which are causing a development to go ahead? The LBTT will be one factor in the judgments that are made. Um, I don't think it will be the central factor. I think it will be a marginal factor in the judgments that are deployed. Uh, I think much more significant will be what is the capacity to raise the capital to fund the development. What are, what are the what is the likelihood and implicit in all of that? How likely is it will that capital have to be held on to before it's replenished by sales? Uh, all of these factors are much more material to the judgment about whether a development proceeds rather than the, um, the, the rate of, L, of LBTT. So I think the, so the LBTT in principle is a marginal consideration in whether developments uh, are taken forward and certainly not a central factor. And the difference in the, the, the levels that we are setting out, both in terms of where we, we are more competitive and to use that terminology or less competitive to use that terminology uh, are very marginal factors in the judgments that would be deployed. Okay, thank you. And the final area I wanted to touch on was uh, we had evidence from SFHA about mid-market rent. And I think most of us in the committee are sympathetic to the concept of mid-market rent, uh, whereby um, it, it's a bit more affordable than the, to the completely private sector. The, the suggestion was that in order to encourage mid-market rent, um, there should be further reliefs to those that are seeking to make that kind of development. 
And I wondered whether, if you, if we are helping that kind of sector, is it better to do it by tax relief or is it better to do with a direct grant? Because we had a similar debate around um, kind of eco-friendly housing as to whether you do that by relief or by subsidy. And I just wondered, if, I'm not asking you to commit to supporting mid-market rent, but I just wonder how, if we were doing it, what is the best way of doing it? I... I the first thing to say, and I, I've, I've read the SFHE evidence and I've seen some of the uh, the dialogue that the committee has had with the SFHE this morning, I, I'd, I'd have to say, well, the first thing I'd say is that obviously, you know, the government will always give consideration to propositions that come forward and suggestions that are advanced. Um, but I, I've got a couple of caveats that I would apply to that. One is that I was very clear with Parliament and with the committee, and I felt throughout the process of the bill I had very firm support from the committee uh, in the judgments I was arriving at, was that we did not want to create, um, if I could call it or describe it, a relief-strewn bill. The committee was very clear, I was clear with the committee, and I felt the committee was supportive of this position, that where relief was um, required, was necessary, was genuine, and had firm purpose, it should be granted. But we should not replicate all of the reliefs that were available, for example, under SDLT, because that would simply replicate some of the difficulties and challenges that exist with SDLT in terms of tax compliance. And we've just gone th we're just going through a debate as a you know, within the United Kingdom about tax compliance and tax avoidance. And as the committee knows, the government has decided to take the strongest possible stance we can on tax avoidance. And of course, the more reliefs we have, the more ground is opened up to potentially have practices that we might not have, env have envisaged at the conception of the legislation. So that's one caveat, that I'm naturally cautious about extending reliefs. That's why I was reluctant when I was in front of the committee in the earlier stages to go into the territory of subsale relief I've been persuaded of the merits of that argument by the industry and we've gone into it in a fashion that I think is consistent with the legislation. But I think we have to be careful about how much we open up that uh, process. Um, and, and, this, and the second caveat is really the point that Mr Mason has raised in his question, that we have to be, when we are looking at solving a challenge like improving the availability of mid-market rent properties, we need to take the most effective intervention to do that, not take another intervention because a piece of legislation happens to be in front of Parliament that seems like a good idea to advance when it may not be the most effective mechanism for stimulating mid-market rent properties. And I think I, I would much prefer us to take forward um, a policy and a more direct financial support mechanism. If I think, for example, about... The National Housing Trust, which aims to deliver properties for mid-market rent into the bargain, that's been very successful. It involves um, a very low level of government uh, financial support and relies on the private market, but it has been very successful in, a, in, in rolling out the, the delivery of mid-market rent properties. And I think when we have mechanisms like that around, uh, we, we, should, we should do all that we can to ensure they're successful. That's great. Thank you. It's definitely you then. Thank you. Uh, Richard, and followed by uh, Gavin. Excellent. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, my questions are also regarding um, multiple dwellings relief um, with regard to the evidence we had from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations uh, on um, homes for mid-market rent, which is a, a big issue in terms of en enabling more people to get the, the housing they need. So it's a big issue in terms of a, a progressive approach, which we welcome the fact you've sought a progressive approach in this, uh, in this um, uh, through, the, through the Act. But in three areas, the SFHA say changes are made which, in fact, are detrimental to um, pr proceeding with schemes for... Um, um, uh, homes for mid-market rent. In terms of uh, the costs they'll be for housing associations, um, in fact, being higher than under stamp duty in terms of uh, the transactions uh, for the homes for mid-market rent um, and also, indeed, on the purchase of land 
through a back-to-back -back sale from a developer as well as a purchase of multiple properties. I mean, given the fact you said you wanted this to be an, a, a measure which brought in a, a great element of um, uh, progressivity within um, these provisions, why didn't you ensure that with this kind of very important scheme in terms of housing provision, it wasn't a detrimental impact, but preferably, in fact, something which would encourage more um, mid-market rent homes to be built, because there seems to be something of a danger here that will actually discourage these developments uh, if, the, um, if the, the, the instrument goes through as it's currently proposed. I, I challenge some of the evidence that's been put in front of the committee. For example, the, the point that Mr Baker makes about, um, you know, posits a, a particular scenario of land purchases from a developer, for example. Well, that, that, that's one particular scenario. It doesn't have to be the scenario in which um, land becomes available or is accessed by um, a housing association to take forward mid-market rent properties. So I think we have to be very careful about the, um, the positing of particular scenarios um, that... Um, because of a general view that Parliament has taken that we want to minimise the risk of tax avoidance, that that is used as an argument for suggesting somehow there is um, a, a disadvantage being created as part of the process. So I think we've got to be very careful about some of that evidence. What we've, um, what the government has set out is um, a progressive approach, approach to the delivery of this policy, um, it is designed to ensure that um, the uh, payment of a uh, tax relates to the value and the development of the, uh, the, the the value of particular developments and the significance of those developments. I think some of the issues that Mr. Mason raised earlier on um, are more material to whether or not uh, a development takes its course rather than um, the uh, assumption that uh, somehow an action with an LBTT, which, as I said in my response to the convener, will be a marginal factor, has any effect on the decisions to take forward a particular development. But the SFHA, again, is quite a clear example in their evidence, which says, in, you know, they say, an example of buying 20 properties, that, OK, it may be slightly marginal, but in fact that um, under this provision, which you're putting forward, there will be a greater... Um, cost to the housing association for the purchase of those properties than there are, is under um, stamp duty. Now that seems to me to be going backwards, not forwards, in terms of encouraging these kind of developments. Well, but that's 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 a that's a that's going to be a marginal factor in all of this. I think I've, I've made my point to the convener. This is all this is all in the marginal territory. Secondly, and the committee's got to be very careful where it goes here, because the issue. The reason why the tax charge may be higher is not because of the absence of a relief. It's because of the proposed rate of 4.5%. Now, if we decide, if the committee believes that we should start to litter the legislation with reliefs to provide exemptions, then the committee will open up mm -hmm. the opportunities for tax avoidance in this legislation. That is the danger the committee would run if it follows that line of argument. So the issue, because the, 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 what we've done with the rates is we have related the rates much more closely to the size of transaction to encourage and to motivate um, a greater level of activity by having a more competitive rate at the lower end of the property transaction so there's a higher rate at the larger property transactions. If we then try to say, well, that we want to temper that by putting a relief in place, then I caution the committee that it's going into the territory that the committee expressly tried to avoid when it scrutinised this legislation some months ago. Well, I was on the committee at that point, Cabinet Secretary, well, so it seems to me I've got carte blanche to litter the, the thing with relief as much as I would want, but I'm not suggesting that because... What I'm suggesting is quite a specific issue here, and surely it sh shouldn't be beyond the wit of the Scottish Government on, on an issue you know, where it involves a housing association, a quite clearly defined entity in law. It's very difficult to pretend to be a housing association, as we heard earlier on, um, to ensure that this wasn't not even just beneficial to these kind of proposals, but in fact not detrimental compared to the provisions which were in place under stamp duty.
Well, I think that's that's it, clearly it's a proposition that can be advanced if people wish to advance that proposition. But I'm simply setting out to the committee the issues that it would have to consider if it wished to advance uh, some of these arguments. Okay, um, finally then, um, in fact, what the Scottish Federation of Housing Association has said that it would be quite a good, in fact, be a strong case for an exemption for housing associations pursuing these kind of developments um, from um, LBTT to encourage their development. It wouldn't actually uh, be a huge cost to the Scottish Government at all, given that they say it's quite a specific area, um, but it is very important. What consideration has been given um, to that by yourself, Cabinet Secretary? Has there been any dialogue with um, housing associations on, on that issue? And in fact, you know, I, I, I can understand your, your, your caution on this area, but is it something you'd be prepared to consider for the future? Well, as, as I said at the outset of my answer, I, I, I'm, the Government is always prepared to consider um, these issues, and um, I certainly will consider this. In the evidence you, the committee heard this morning, there was no um, a financial impact placed on those proposals put in front of the committee this morning. Uh, obviously, if an exemption, if it wasn't just a relief, it was an exemption, then that would affect the tax take, it would affect the estimates that I make, that money has to come from somewhere. Um, and um, the, um, the, the, the judgments that are being arrived at here um, are about what is the appropriate tax charge to be made on particular developments. Um, and uh, the, obviously there is flexibility within the legislation to determine whether that tax charge should be varied for one organisation or another, um, but um, th th that's certainly something I'm happy to discuss with the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Okay. I'm finished, yeah. Um, brief supplementary remarks. Okay, that's fine. Gavin, to follow by Mark. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned some work on forestalling being done by the, Fis the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Is there a timescale for that work to be completed and published? The discussions are, are ongoing. With you know, We're carrying out further research work based on what the, um, the Fiscal Commission have requested of us. Um, it's, it's not a matter for me what judgment the Fiscal Commission come to. They will come to their judgment and uh, they would have to set out the timescale. Specific time scale. I, well, the, 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 the issues around forestalling, I, um, I expect, uh, indeed I think the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, when he appeared before the committee, um, indicated that he expected forestalling discussions to go on into the start of the next financial year, which is later than I certainly would like to be the case, but um, uh, it takes two to make a negotiation, so we'll, um, uh, obviously we'll carry on the work that was being undertaken with the Scottish Fiscal Commission, but in terms of the, the management of that work and the determination of that work is a matter for the Fiscal Commission. Sure. Okay. Um, in, in December, when you gave evidence to us, it was your view at the time, and this was just before the autumn statement, that there would be no behavioural impact as a result of the LBTT rates that you were setting. Um, obviously, we then had the autumn statement, which changed things. But is it, is it still your view that there would be no behavioural impact at all um, if we hadn't had the autumn statement? Do you put all of the forestalling down to that, or do you accept now that some of it was down to LBTT being different from the existing stamp duty? The, uh, the, there will obviously be, um, you know, individuals will make their, their judgments about property transactions on a, a wide variety of factors. I, I don't think LBTT leads to a particularly uh, significant behavioural response. Um, uh, but clearly, um, there was a, a, you know, a very um, a, a, you know, additional uh, impact on the market, which came from the autumn statement, which has added some, you know, further, um, some further un uncertainty into the marketplace, which uh, I suspect we'll see reflected in forestalling. Okay. Attempt, you were asked about the impact so far, and you basically said the evidence you had was the, I think, the quarterly house price index, which was published in February, and that related to quarter four. Yeah. I was a bit surprised. I mean, does the Scottish Government, given that you deal with regis registered Scotland more regularly, do you not have a view of, do you not have figures for January, for example, at this stage? Well, what, what I said was there's no published data, okay. and the published data is, is obviously all that I can uh, uh, deal with in terms of the 
um, official output of Registers of Scotland. I obviously keep um, uh, I take a very close interest in the performance of the property market, so I look at a range of uh, different information sources, but there's nothing that is uh, that's indicating to me um, anything to substantiate a change in performance. Okay. Um, now we heard evidence earlier from witnesses who took the view, and this was their opinion, obviously, but they believed that as a consequence of LBTT, if these uh, rates are set, we'll see a depressed level of activity um, at the higher bands uh, of the property market, and this would have a detrimental impact uh, on other steps of the ladder too. That's, that's their view, and I assume the uh, Scottish Government takes a different view. Um, but if they're correct, if this does uh, play out uh, post-April, I mean, will the Scottish Government act? Um, in what respect? Well, if, if it turns out that the Scottish property market is hit um, as a consequence of these rates that you have set, and there's a different result from, say, the north of England or uh, the Midlands, for example, maybe I would treat London separately, but if, if the Scottish market does appear to uh, be hit detrimentally as a result of these rates, will the Scottish Government act and change those rates to try and help the market function? No. No? No. Okay. But you would review it, presumably this is reviewed at budget time each year, but Correct. You, you would, you, you, as your position now is you would do nothing um, prior to then. That is correct. That's correct. Okay. Mark? Uh, my question was dealt with by Gavin. He asked what I was going to ask in terms of uh, impact <laughs> on impact on market performance. Well, okay. uh, that's, what, that's, what I get, that's, that, that's what I get for saying I would wait until after Gavin. So. It's a great minds think I like or fools never differ. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, let's move on to <coughs> agenda item six, um, which is the debate on the motion uh, S4M-12346. I invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move the motion. Cabinet uh, Secretary. Formally moved, Kavir. I now put the question on the motion. And the question is that motion S4M12346 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I now move straight on to agenda item six, which, uh, seven, which is to move uh, to the debate on motion S4M12347. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to formally move the motion. Uh, move, Kavir. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M12347 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we are not agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour of the motion? All those against? Uh, the motion is carried by six votes to one. Um, and uh, we are now um, will have a one minute recess while we have a changeover in witnesses. So nobody budge, committee members. From the Cabinet Secretary on four statutory instruments relating to public service pensions. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by John St. Clair, Chad Daughtry, and Jim Preston of the Scottish Government. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement explaining the instruments and remind him not to move the motions at this point. Cabinet Secretary. Kavira, the Scottish Government is currently implementing reforms of public service pension schemes required by the Public Service Pensions Act 2013 of the United Kingdom Parliament. The changes in the instruments the Committee is considering today form part of those reforms. Those Scottish Ministers have executively devolved responsibility for these schemes. Overall occupational pension policy remains reserved. Indeed, the key terms of in Timetable 4 
The reforms were set out by the UK Government in the Public Service Pensions Act 2013. That Act also requires that instruments which amend primary legislation are considered under affirmative procedures. As the Committee knows, the reforms will effectively close the existing pension schemes on 31 March 2015. This means that the new schemes and important transitional protections for pension rights already built up to that point need to be in place from 1 April. These instruments make necessary consequential modifications to the Pension Schemes Act 1993 and to the Finance Act 2004 to ensure that the NHS teachers, police and firefighters pension schemes work as intended within the complex wider framework of pensions and tax law and that pension scheme members who transfer to the new schemes retain accrued, right, accrued pension rights. In brief, the proposed modifications set out in parts two to four of each of the instrument are common to each of the four schemes. Additional provisions are set out in part five for the teachers, police and firefighters schemes. Under part two, modifications are made to regulations governing contracting out of the additional state pension. Though contracting out will end in April 2016, the new schemes remain contracted out until then, and the changes introduced in Part 2 reflect the UK Government's simplified contracting out election process for the new schemes for this financial year. In Part 3, modifications are made to the Pension Schemes Act 1993 so that members who move from the current schemes to the 2015 schemes are not wrongly treated as deferred members of their existing schemes. Modifications under Part 3 ensure that pension benefits that scheme members have accrued to date are revalued correctly and not as if those individuals were deferred members. A scheme member's right to a cash equivalent transfer value, a refund of contributions or to a cash transfer sum applies only when they leave the new scheme. And guaranteed minimum pension safeguards operate as intended by modifying anti-franking provisions. These modifications will mean that for those purposes, such individuals do not cease to be active members of their existing scheme until they leave their new scheme. Part 4 modifications to the Finance Act 20, 2004 make sure that members with service in both pre- and post-2015 pension schemes who retire with an ill health pension do not face unintended co tax consequences. Part 5 of the Police and Firefighters Instruments modify the Pension Schemes Act 1993 in line with the requirements of the Public Service Pensions Act 2013 to permit active and deferred members in these schemes to have different pension ages. Part 5 of the Teachers' Instrument is designed to reflect in the short service provisions of the Pension Scheme Act that different rates of actuarial reduction for active and deferred members are provided for in the Teachers' Pension Scheme regulations for members with a normal pension age above 65. In conclusion, uh, these are very technical modifications to wider pensions legislation which seek to ensure that teachers, NHS workers, police officers and firefighters in Scotland can get the pensions that they expect without any unexpected effects as a result of potential conflicts with wider pensions and tax law. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I have no questions, but uh, the Deputy Convener does. Convener, I have the privilege of being on the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, so I have uh, been at both ends uh, of this. Their convener, uh, Nigel Dawn, I think has written to you, Cabinet Secretary, and has also written to this committee uh, about the timing of when the regulations were laid, and especially making the point that uh, the new scheme regulations, other than the teacher's pension scheme, were laid after the regulations making consequential provision. <coughs> which uh, has caused and potentially could cause a bit of a problem. Could you comment on that? I think uh, well, I'm, I'm, I deeply regret the fact that the Deputy Convener is on the Delegated law <laughs> Powers and Law Reform Committee since this has flushed out this issue. But uh, there, there, is a, you know, there is an issue here, and, and the government is obviously is, is trying to operate as helpfully as we can in this respect, but I accept that it's not an ideal situation that we face. Essentially, um, the... <coughs> The instruments that uh, are in front of the Finance Committee today are required to make alterations to primary legislation, which is provided for, but has to be undertaken by the affirmative procedure. And these issues became apparent um, towards the end of last year um, and affect pieces of statute under which the substantive regulations that the Delegated uh, Powers Committee 
has not well had sight of these modifications before they had sight of the substantive regulations. And my reason for going to that explanation is to basically say these orders in front of the, the Finance Committee today address problems that arose from the interaction of um, new legislation with old legislation which had not been seen at the time of the Pensions Reform Act of 2013. So they're in, quite, they're in two quite different spheres of impact. Um, and the substantive regulations were on a, a pace of development which you know, we knew about, you know, we'd been working on and expected to take their course, but these new issues have emerged which have required these additional orders. That's about, that's, about the, that's about the best I can do, I think. Okay, I mean, was this partly, was the timing under the control of the Scottish Government or was it partly because of the UK timing? It, it's the, 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 the timing of the substantive scheme regulations has been a product of the UK legislation but the Scottish Government obviously had to act in a fashion to make sure those regulations were in place to be effective from the 1st of April 2016. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, we've had to take action to get those regulations in place and subject to parliamentary consent, they will be in place and according to the timescale that we envisaged. The difficulty has arisen out of the interaction between new legislation and old legislation, which has essentially has flushed out some very technical issues that have had to be raised in these orders and that is why they've come to the committee in the sequence that they have come. Because I think the one example that and I, I accept is fairly minor was that you know the different terms got used in the different regulations so in one in a I think it's part 13 it talks about upper uh, ill health t upper tier ill health pension whereas elsewhere it's called higher um, and you know that's not ideal so I, so I suppose the main thing I would look for is, can we have an assurance that this might not happen again? Well, we, we, well, my officials are actually meeting with the clerking team from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee actually after this session of the Finance Committee to talk through all of the issues that have arisen out of here. Um, the, Mr Mason is absolutely correct. Both the Minister for Parliamentary Business and I have um, had correspondence with um, the convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, I wouldn't for a moment suggest that the, the arrangements we're wrestling with today are ideal. I would uh, be very keen to make sure we didn't find ourselves in this circumstance again. But it, it's really arisen out of the fact that um, new material has emerged that has had to be rectified to make sure that pensioners could maintain existing rights from the 31st of March into the 1st of April, which would not have been the case unless we had brought forward the instruments that are in front of the France Committee today. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are no further questions, uh, Cabinet Secretary, so we'll now move uh, on to item 9, which is a debate on motion S4M12363. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move the motion. It moved, Convener. Uh, thank you. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M12363 <coughs> be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Uh, we now move on to uh, item 10, which is a debate on motion S4M 12364. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move the motion. Uh, move, Kavir. Uh, thank you. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M 12364 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Uh, moving on to uh, item 11, I invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move motion S4M12365. Cabinet Secretary? Move, Kavir. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M12365 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. And uh, moving on to agenda item 12, I now invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move motion S4M12366. Move, Kavir. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M12366 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Members have indicated their agreement. Uh, the committee will now publish a short report to Parliament, setting out our decisions on all the statutory instruments we have considered today. And uh, at the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next item in private. I therefore like to close this public part of the meeting after thanking the witnesses for their contributions today. Thank you.